Good morning again and welcome back uh, to day two of Moldova Digital Summit. We are happy to have you both online and offline here. And uh, today we're going to discuss about a lot of topics of interest, but um, some of them will be digital education, Eastern partnership, uh, digitalization trends, as well as investments, their opportunities, uh, which are out there, creative industries, but also EU policies. Yesterday we had a thousand people watching us online and 500 here at Techwell. Uh, so today we expect, even if you do see less people in the room, be sure that we have a lot of them who are joining us uh, just because it's easier uh, through the networks online. So uh, let's get it started. It's going to be an exciting day ahead. It's not the last day. Tomorrow we have another one. So we meet again uh, to have fun. Uh, we are honored to invite the first uh, to open day two of Moldova Digital Summit, Vice Prime Minister on Economic Development and Digitalization, uh, Mr. Dimitro Alaiba. Please welcome on the stage. Morning. I see much less than 500 people uh, in the room, which means yesterday's last night's party was a success. <laughs> But uh, nevertheless, uh, we're looking forward to very engaging and interesting conversations today. We're going to, as, uh, as Marina briefly summed it up, we're going to speak about, uh, about uh, investment, about education, about uh, creative industries, about, uh, about uh, regional cooperation in the digital and, and policy making in the, uh, uh, in the regional uh, context. So, Buckle up because it will be a very interesting um, day and uh, uh, many ideas will be floating around. But, uh, uh, you know, I'll, unfortunately, I won't be able to stay with you all day. Although, you know, yesterday was probably one of the best days of my uh, this five, six, six uh, month uh, career as minister because I had to, I, I got to actually spend all day with one event with you and to, to actually engage and speak, you know, it's enough for, for you know, one, one or two minutes over a coffee or, or just, uh, you know, fish some ideas uh, for, from a panelist because this is, this is what really helps us uh, be and stay fresh with our thoughts and our ideas. When you, when you end up in a ministry, you kind of tend to uh, sort of uh, push a dead end if you don't uh, engage with uh, with the people and if you don't if you don't hunt and uh, and look for new ideas. Nevertheless, uh, enjoy your day. Today is the second day. Tomorrow is uh, another day. So careful with the parties again. Also tonight, you know, you're not um, 16 anymore. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward and I'll, I'll join you also tomorrow, I hope. Um, I hear also one of, the, one of our panelists is late, so that means the party was really good. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, yesterday we had two speakers opening uh, the session, uh, the opening session. Today we also have two wonderful speakers. Uh, the first one to go uh, represents a country that is uh, uh, very much involved in supporting and promoting women, inclusion, digitalization, transparency, so on and so forth. Um, Her Excellency Katarina Fried, Ambassador of Sweden to Moldova. Please welcome on stage. Good morning, uh, dear Deputy Prime Minister, colleagues, friends, Bona Dimenyatsa. It's nice to be here again. Um, I'm very honored to be able to welcome everyone to day two of the 2023 Moldova Digital Summit. I'm excited to be here with all of you as we continue to build on the successful events of the week. And I'm really happy to see that those of you that did make it back from yesterday's gala are as beautiful today. And uh, once again, congratulations to all the winners and the organizers for the successful event. I also really like to thank the uh, event organizers and partners for selecting this year's summit motto to our borderless future, which highlights how Moldovan government and industry professionals are working towards Moldova's digital integration with the rest of the world. Sweden is sometimes highlighted as a digital lead, and for good reasons, if I may say so. 94% uh, of the Swedish populations are using the internet, 
um, most of us every day, and over 70% are using our digital IDs daily. We are a home to successful global startups, and our current government has launched a very ambitious plan to drive digital transformation in education, transportation, healthcare, and national security. We have learned a lot through this, and still yet we have a lot more to learn. What I would like to, all of you to have in mind today and in the continued development of Moldova's and the borderless global digital transformation is that with every development there are factors to take into account that can make our societies even more successful. And one such key factor is gender equality, no surprise coming from me. Access to internet does not automatically mean access to shaping the internet and the digital development. In EU member states, only 90% of the ICT specialists are women. And in the ICT industry, women are on average paid 10% less than men. Worldwide, there is a digital divide between men and women that affect our global well-being. So let's keep on working towards gender equality, also digitally. Equality in tech lowers the risk of built-in biases in products. It opens up for innovation of inclusive societies and gender equality equal societies are absolutely key for economic prosperity. With that said, Sweden is thrilled to be a partner in Moldova's journey towards an inclusive and equal digital future. Thank you for being here, and I wish you a productive and stimulating continuation of the Moldova Digital Summit. Mutsumes. Thank you so much. As you can see, we have more gender balance today, <laughs> including in the opening speeches and not only. Um, but uh, once again, we do have our marks raising in terms of how many women are engaged uh, within the ICT sector. Uh, also due to the fact that there are a lot of investments into the education. And uh, we also are happy to have another partner here with us. Uh, and it's Maha Damash, uh, who, uh, who is the head of the... Of, uh, UNICEF Moldova. So please welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's a little dangerous to give me a microphone because I might just stay here for longer than I should. So I count on you to pull me off. Thank you all very much. It's really an honor to be here today to talk about digital transformation of education. And I'm very appreciative that I'm actually on the same, uh, in the same group, or in the same group of speakers as Minister Alaiba and as Ambassador Katrina Fried, because when we talk about digital transformation of education, that investment is the investment for sustainable economic development. I really cannot stress this enough. It's not about the bells and whistles. There's, there's two aspects, and I feel sometimes we kind of blur the two. When we talk about digital transformation of education, one part of it is, of course, introduction to digital skills, becoming part of the digital world, which is necessary because that's really where the world is. But the other part of it is disrupting education, disrupting the way education is managed and run in a manner that actually improves the quality of education for every child. It is about bringing in the digital tools, the opportunities that digital technology provides to change the way classes are run, to change the way things are taught, and indeed, to change the curriculum. I don't know uh, with the background of everyone in the room or really everyone uh, online either, so allow me to, to phrase things that may be obvious to you, but really are important. When we talk about the digital transformation of education, at UNICEF, foremost in our mind are children who are left behind or are lagging. Children with special educational needs or have different learning abilities. If you were to think for a moment back to your own classrooms, your sixth grade, who are the children in your, in your class, or even maybe yourself, who are not catching up with math? It was moving a little too fast. You miss a part of math, it becomes very hard to catch all the others. Now imagine if you had the possibility that the classroom was run in such a way that it actually attended to your needs. There was an application or a program that allowed you to learn fractions and common denominators in your own way, at your own pace. You could actually learn it not necessarily just through numbers, but through pie charts, if that was easier, if that was the way you learned, if that's the way you acquired knowledge. Let's also assume, in fact, this is the opportunity that it presents, that in the same classroom, the colleagues, your, your friend sitting next to you, knows them like this, so they can move on. So you actually have a, a way that you have a classroom that is very much child-centered, that is actually going as per your strengths and 
the gaps that need strengthening without the, the embarrassment of falling behind, without the difficulty of needing tutors, without the extra homework that doesn't make sense, it actually gets to a point where everyone reaches the same learning objective. They have to reach the same learning objective. <laughs> but those who, who need, that, need that extra attention receive it from the teacher, but also with, through this application at a self-paced manner. And those who can do more can do more, right? But then the class moves together and the teacher is able to manage the classroom in such a way that she or he is not uh, targeting the smartest in the class or, or, or the one who's struggling the most in the class or the average. In my school, it was always uh, to the smartest. So everyone else le was left behind. And I think that's generally the way it goes, that if the smartest understands, the teacher feels, okay, I got it, and they move on. Let's also remember, and I say this because my mother was a teacher and my father was a teacher and I am generally a big fan of teachers who really are dedicated to this. Teachers need these tools. The way the classroom is set up, the way education is currently set up has not really been, as I said, interrupted. And if we want to make this shift that we call for, for child-centered classrooms and child-centered education and child-centered assessments and so on, it's unfair to expect all of that from one teacher. These technological tools assist the teacher to do this. Okay, that's the end of my lecture. <laughs> Let me say that when we do this, and because we're talking about the system of education, we're not talking about extracurricular activities, we're not talking about, we're talking about the system of education, which needs to be led by the government and needs to be led by the Ministry of Education because the ministry defines the type of citizen that they want. Do they want a citizen who is a follower do they want a citizen, as in Moldova, who is a critical thinker and an, and an entrepreneur? Or do you want a citizen, et cetera, et cetera? And so when you do that, you have to create the system. You have to create the curriculum, the assessment, and the policies. Because you also, though you want to introduce the flexibility, you don't want every school to be different. You want the child to have the same opportunity wherever they are, and you want the school to be held to that same standard. And I say this because that's part of what we're doing. We have the honor at the moment to be working with the Ministry of Education and Research to actually be addressing the policies and the structures that a digital transformation of learning means. And we're very proud that we're learning from everything that's been happening. We've been learning from the different experiences of Tequil in every school. We've been learning from the different experiences of the, of the hub in, in, in Kahul and the work that's being done by the Swedes, by the English, by the Americans. And we're learning also from our own work where we've been running Girls Go IT because I do agree with the ambassador. It's essential and important that there is gender equality and there are less and less girls who go into STEAM. I myself am an engineer, and I won't tell you how old I am, but many, many years ago when I was in university, there were two of us in the classroom, two girls, to the rest who are boys. So that also has changed, but needs to change much more. And that is what we, we try to do, and we are doing in the Girls Go IT program, in the STEAM on Wheels uh, program, and in different uh, um, initiatives where we learn so that we can also inform and bring that back to policy and standards. I, I love the theme of evolve because, you know, I started here, you know, coming, let's revolutionize, but actually it's like, let's evolve education to really meet the needs and the rights of every child in this century. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as you can understand, education will be part of the second day, but not only the second day, the third day as well. Uh, also, just to mention that we will have a party tonight again, <laughs> so make sure to be fresh tomorrow through the Tackle Expo because we do expect a lot of uh, children, uh, a lot of uh, talented uh, youth coming to Tequil to discover what's going to happen next and what are the trends. Uh, this being said, we're still not going far from education, are coming back to investments and we have uh, our first panel for, for, for day uh, two, uh, specifically focused uh, on investments. Uh, but until we announce who's on the panel and uh, what are their details, we will put a, a short video online to make sure to set the, the setting up.
And we are back. Um, now we're going to talk uh, about investments. And together with us, uh, we will have uh, three panelists. And the moderator of the session is uh, the administrator of Moldova Innovation Technology Park, Natalia Donzo. And we also have uh, representatives from three companies uh, that joined us uh, today. Um, but uh, I'll let Natalia get more into the panelists. Uh, however, we're happy to have together with us uh, Sergio Placint, Alona Levka, and George Teodorescu, um, and I think from your own experience you will uh, try to go in depth about challenges, but uh, first of all, what are the opportunities of Moldova in terms of investments whenever discussing tech uh, trends and tech companies? Natalia, the floor is to you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's been uh, mentioned a lot about uh, yesterday party. It was actually an event happened for the first time in uh, Moldova, Moldova Innovation Awards, which celebrated the innovative people and companies, products and initiatives that we have here in Moldova. And it's been really a pleasure to see what are the champions of our ecosystem and also to bring in so many international guests to also discover the Moldovan digital ecosystem via the champions that we have here. I am very pleased to have uh, here today near uh, me Sergio Placinta, who is Director of International Operations at Orange Systems. Is actually uh, one of the biggest, the second biggest IT employer in uh, Moldova. Alena Levkuk, who is uh, CEO at uh, Amgrider ICT, it's a startup with uh, Swedish capital, which develops products in cybersecurity. And also Georgia Teodorescu, who is regional manager at Mixbook, a company with roots in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, indeed, uh, as we mentioned, every ecosystem is developed while we have interactions and interconnections between the government, the private sector, the academia research, and so on. And Moldova has uh, actually made uh, a lot of efforts, but also adopted some innovative models while thinking about how we can develop the, the IT sector. Um, five years ago, um, our government launched a virtual IT park, Moldova Innovation Technology Park, whose residents benefit of 7% single tax flight rate and who was not turned only into a tax saving for the company and making Moldova very competitive in the region, although it made it the most competitive in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, but also uh, gave a new vibe and a new, uh, a new inspiration for the, for the business as well. And we would like to debrief and have um, a very open discussion today about how this uh, model and other government initiative actually impacted the, the business in, uh, in Moldova. Uh, what we can see overall from the pictures is that we, the IT sector grew more than three times in five years and the exports of uh, IT services count now for 11% of our country's total exports of products and goods. If we had a share of 1.5% in GDP back in 2016, now we have 5.1% of our GDP generated solely by the IT sector, by 22,000 uh, people. But it's very interesting also to know not only what is the macroeconomic impact of this model, but to see how it actually impacted the business. And I would like to ask Sergio Placinta, Sergio, from your, from your company's perspective, what this model changed, what it's um, transformed in the way you doing business at Orange Systems? Thank you, Natalia, for this question. Good morning, everyone. Uh, most probably few of you knows uh, Orange System started its operations back in 2008. It was just a team of eight people doing some services inside the group. And today, after 15 years of operations, we become second biggest IT employer. We have more than 800 employees. 
but in this period of time, we had two important milestones. So first one in 2014, when group allowed us to go external. So we start serving external customers, not only inside the group. Uh, this was a significant boost in our opportunities to grab additional services to Moldova. Uh, but the second one, which is much more important, is 2018. And it's just in the year when the, the IT park was established and we joined this park. Yeah. So we took one year to, to analyze the operational transformation and the financial benefits that we can get out of this new, new fiscal regime. And we completely changed our strategy. So we move uh, from the service-oriented company to the one that would invest strongly in products and solutions. Uh, and by solutions, I mean uh, creating center of competence that would generate additional value and more value to our customers. Uh, and which is even more important, we decided to invest in our own products. Yeah. So yeah, in 2019, it was very ambitious. We consider ourselves sort of startup inside an enterprise. And what in 2019 was just um, a fancy digital app for our innovative space called Orange Kitchen. Uh, today is a commercial product. It's in fact a complete ecosystem that supports big, several big enterprises uh, to manage effectively the utilization of their office space. Uh, I mean, workplace, park place, meeting rooms. Yeah. So ourselves, even Orange in Moldova, uh, by returning back from the um, from the pandemic and still staying in the hybrid way of working, we succeed to to reduce more than 40% of our. Uh, offices and uh, still stay dynamically and manage the attendance in a very well organized manner. Yeah. This, this app is used now today by more than 40,000 uh, people, 40,000 users, and still to, to expand it further. Yeah. And the second one uh, about solutions and the value added, as well in 2019, we decided to invest the, the fiscal benefits that we've got. Uh, in center of competence and the most eloquent one would be around the robotic process automation uh, and why I mentioned is that still after five years we are the only company in this country to, to have this kind of skill set so we invest more than two years in creating competence uh, in building knowledge and know-how in creating capacity so that today uh, we have more than 10 external customers for which we support them in their digital transformation journey uh, and in a nutshell, it's just like 500 robots that are working 24 by 7 uh, to save more than 50,000 hours on a monthly basis uh, uh, on manual execution of uh, transactions that uh, uh, those companies have before uh, in a manual way. Yeah. Why I mention about these two, uh, two aspects is that uh, this fiscal environment allow us, uh, not only from the perspective of savings to do some investments, uh, but as well from the perspective of securing our investments. Yeah? So this park was created for 10 years, yeah? so giving sort of stability and predictability. Uh, and we decided to invest the, the money in the right way. And of course, second one, uh, second aspect of, uh, of the fiscal benefits yeah, is directly uh, perceived from the attraction and retention of the, of the people in this country. Uh, of course, we were, we've been able to pay uh, competitive wages, I invest in the innovative spaces in benefits, uh, but what is even more important is that uh, we start contributing to the IT community, uh, sponsoring events, creating awareness about the ICT industry, and beyond than that. So we support academia by uh, investing in laboratories, uh, in uh, shaping the educational studies, and all this one is positively impacting the retention of the students that remained in this country and continue their story and um, uh, experience here in Moldova. Yeah. I think this is uh, really amazing because indeed, uh, historically speaking, Moldova would be known like an um, outsourcing uh, country in terms of uh, IT and our vision is actually to um, put all to put together all the efforts to um, orient more on products development because indeed we have so many talented people in here that, that we could build those products that would even keep higher added value here in the, in the country and it's very good to see that the companies not only took like this uh, fiscal incentive from themselves but also improved the conditions for the people and started working on uh, solutions. 
Sergio mentioned about the predictability, how important it is in terms of uh, security, investments, business, business uh, perspective. And um, here I would like to, to ask George um, from his uh, point of view, because indeed we have uh, the park created for uh, 10 years uh, period and uh, a state guarantee which lasts for the next uh, three years. We have currently um, a draft law on extending the park and its state guarantee with another uh, 10 years. And very curious to see what is the business perspective on this and how important it is for companies. Because at macroeconomic level, it is already proven that those countries which have previsibility in terms of uh, public policies, especially in terms of fiscal policies, then they have the chance to increase their GDP at least by 1%. Let's see what is the business view on it. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I was about to say, if anybody saw me sneaking a couple of minutes late, the, if you judge by the traffic outside, I think Silicon Valley is already in Moldova, right? I think challenge is going to be bringing the rest of it. But uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, I work, my name is George Teodorescu. I work for Mixbook, which is a, a Silicon Valley company. It's a company specializing in uh, digital memories, transferring digital memories on uh, paper support. We, you know, much of our business is photo books. So we do photo books for clients. Um, but of course, behind the magic of photo books, there is a great website and a great editor, which we need a lot of very talented uh, tech uh, uh, personnel, which actually we found here. So we have an office here. Uh, we have revenues of uh, over $50 million a year. So a lot of our, most of our technical staff is here. So if you ever go to mixbook.com, all the magic was done here. Now, interestingly enough, when Mixbook decided to expand into Moldova, I should go back probably a few seconds and say, uh, my background is not tech. My background is legal. I'm a lawyer. And lawyers famously don't know anything about tech. I didn't know anything about tech. And you know, at the time when I started working for Mixbook, I barely knew how to use uh, Microsoft Word. But one of the things that I did know how, uh, I did have a bit of an expertise on, is that I had run a law firm, uh, an international law firm in Moldova for about six years before this. And our law firm, my previous employer, uh, used to help foreign investors come to Moldova and open companies or invest in Moldova. So a lot of my previous experience had to do with how to shepherd and help investors in an environment like Moldova, a developing country, a country which uh, you know um, has had some turbulent history. I arrived here uh, two weeks before uh, uh, April 7, 2009. So when I set up the law firm, the parliament was burning the presidency was burning, and I was like, wow, it's going to be a lot of investment in Moldova. I can't wait to get all these investors right here. So obviously, when I came here with Mixbook, the second time around, the first thing, the first worry was, of course, you know, you watch CNN, you read a little bit about Moldova, and you're like, is it safe? Is it the right kind of place? Is the government, you know, stable? Are the laws all right? And uh, as my specialty in the past used to be um, international arbitration. So I represent an investor oftentimes who would lose you know, the investment in countries. I was particularly sensitive to the stability of the government, to the stability of the laws, to the simplicity of the laws, and also to how little uh, tangents oftentimes businesses should have with the government. So when we initially opened, to be honest, we opened via an outsourcing company in order to minimize the risk, like a lot of companies do, by the way. That's an easy way to get your feet wet into a country and not really you know, pay the price too much. Um, but shortly thereafter, within a few months, uh, we had a bunch of discussions with uh, some of the uh, people involved in drafting the IT Parks Law. And we became more and more convinced that uh, the investment, a direct investment in Moldova would be very, you know, would actually pay off. So um, the first thing that, that mattered for us, I think, is the simplicity of doing business. I think doing business in a simple way uh, with less uh, government interface, 
was best. This is what we're going through, right? Digitalization, everything else that has to do with that was, was exciting. Um, we were curious how it's going to work in practice. Um, so uh, after about a few months, after a year or so, we realized it's not just working well, it's probably one of the best ideas ever. Uh, and I think we became somewhat evangelists in Silicon Valley uh, about the idea of IT parks uh, and, and not only. So I think for us and for someone that has seen you know, investments in developing countries that could go sour, uh, the IT parks law, the ease of doing business, and the way the system is created in order uh, just to allow an investor to take on just the business risk, not the country risk, not the political risk, but the business risk, which is everybody does, uh, was a lifesaver. So, you know, maybe myself and Mixbook are a bit spoiled now because when we do look at other countries or jurisdictions, the first thing we ask is how, you know, you guys have an IT park, you have an investment law, what's your, you know, and uh, not a lot of countries have that. They have incentives, but the way, the comprehensive way um, the, the Moldovan government and the professionals who are here today, uh, lots of stakeholders, lots of people who made a difference, uh, the way they've done it um, has really, at least for us, been uh, a lifesaver. I mean, is it perfect? No. You know, as, as uh, I think as uh, Natalia mentioned, the IT parks um, guarantees are about to be extended. There's always a trepidation and wonder what happened, you know, you are, you're fully invested, you know, 10 years have passed, and you kind of start wondering, you know, do we get another guarantees? Guarantees are very important, right? When you, you know, work like I used to in uh, uh, international arbitration, what the state says and does is very important. And so far, the first round of guarantees have been amazing. So I think the real question is going to be, are we going to get an equally great extension, which it sounds like is going to happen. Um, but I think other than that, is I'm very hard pressed to see any downside to our experience here or uh, to doing business in Moldova under the new legal regime. So I don't know if there's any questions, you know, I'll take them later, but this is kind of my, uh, I may sound a little bit too enthusiastic, that's because I am, uh, but uh, let's hope that uh, things don't change, um, uh, don't change too much, except in the better. Thank you, thank you very much. Georgia, indeed, you mentioned uh, simplicity. Uh, because this single tax encompassed all the taxes that would normally be due by companies and also by the employees, which means the companies would not have to report seven different taxes. They would make a single uh, reporting payment and so on. So uh, simplified a lot of uh, the life of uh, companies including in terms of uh, uh, tax, legal, and accounting compliance, but also interaction with the, uh, with the state. Um, but besides the uh, tax incentives, which were actually, I think, a great investment from uh, our uh, government because if uh, we look back and uh, see that during five years the taxes paid by the IT sector tripled actually in the conditions that uh, the, the tax was uh, cut twice then uh, it's just an uh, amazing example that sometimes or often if the governments would uh, find that uh, optimal tax rate which would be affordable both for the contributors businesses but also uh, uh, individuals uh, it can be it can turn into a great uh, into a great uh, success uh, besides the uh, tax uh, incentives it, it is also uh, important to see what is the environment and how the business actually would see other um, incentives from the government and generally in the ecosystem while talking about making those uh, those investments by the companies and uh, here I would like Alona maybe to give us um, uh, a perspective uh, from a startup company, um, what kind of other incentives would you um, see truly uh, motivating for the companies to, to grow and to, uh, to develop here? Thank you, Natalia. Hello, everyone. Well, first I want to start with a joke that kind of answers and is in uh, line with what George said about simplicity. You know, accountants are people hired by private sector to serve the government. 
So we as private sector, as startup, just cannot afford to hire accountants to serve the government. We are striving, we are a cybersecurity startup, which is hard enough. Uh, we have a very small team. We cannot afford to have a lot of accountants and a lot of additional staff that would work on, uh, uh, on, on reports, on uh, delivering whatever paperwork that the government supposedly needs. Uh, and we are very thankful and we are very happy that right now we have one single accountant working part-time for us and delivering everything that needs to be delivered. This is amazing. And I can tell you that to some extent, uh, for us, the single tax is amazing also, obviously, uh, but even more important is this simplicity of doing business, is this, this that allows us to focus on the creation and delivering of the value to our customers. This is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to deliver that platform for small and medium enterprises. We are supposed to be there for the client and not for the government. It should be the other way around, I believe so, that the government should be there for us, for startups. And when I say that, um, I really want, one, we talked a lot about yesterday gala, and it was fun, it was very nice, but uh, also I, uh, one number, one digit struck, struck me when I heard the speech of Her Excellency Ambassador of Sweden. Uh, she said yesterday that the government of Sweden invests 3% in R&D activities. This is amazing. This is something that I want to be able to tell about our country. Let's invest in R&D activities because again, as a very uh, tech intensive and a very capital intensive startup, uh, we are looking, for, we are constantly raising money. We are constantly looking for any uh, incentives, but unfortunately, and here I have to be a little bit of a critic. Unfortunately, what we have right now in Moldova, it's usually a very small ticket for a tech intensive and capital intensive company. And if the government can come into this equation, if it can come in this formula and bring additional uh, benefit or additional um, points, uh, selling points to, to the investors to help us raise this money, to help us invest in R&D activity, that uh, research and development for, for, for those who don't know the abbreviation. Uh, I'd have to tell you that this is an activity that doesn't have a direct uh, profit that you can see in foreseeable future. So it's something that you burn money actually. And we have to be prepared as a country to invest and to burn this money just to get some ideas that can be truly innovative that can really put Moldova on the innovation map. We are getting there. We are starting to, to place our digital footprint uh, about innovations. But I believe that there is a much longer way to go. And here, one thing, as I said, this uh, uh, investment readiness to invest in R&D activities, support R&D activities. And also, I would like to mention here probably one more thing, uh, the public-private partnerships. Um, again, I'm judging from our perspective, from a startup, and uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, issues, a lot of topics that we are thinking and we are uh, devouring in our uh, R&D teams. And uh, uh, it would greatly help us to have, uh, again, we are in cybersecurity, and right now, uh, if you know, the government is starting to create a cybersecurity incident response team on the national level and on the governmental level. And we would really appreciate a partnership with them because I believe it will benefit both of the parties. It will benefit their state bodies because we can bring this private expertise, we can bring this expertise from a small, medium and larger companies. We do penetration testing, we do vulnerability assessment, we do network discovery and stuff like that. We can show how it's done in the private sector and they can show us what are the problems on the government level, on the national level, and we can take them into account in our solution. So I believe there is a lot of room for this type of partnerships. I've just mentioned one example, but I think there are many, many, many more that can be created. So uh, it's not always about just giving money. Giving money is spending money, and this is not good for the economy. Uh, what we would like to see is the government who is involved 
in uh, the startup culture, who is, who is there with the startups, who is there with the tech companies and understands the current needs of, uh, of our current needs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alena. Um, you mentioned one thing in what you said about the small tickets, and I believe that one of the reasons why we did not yet get that big tickets in Moldova is also because of the legal framework that until now did not quite, uh, you know, allow type of investments that would um, make possible for the companies, you know, to attract big investments for, I mean, under some, some uh, condition, meaning conditional investments. For instance, you can attract um, one uh, million euro, yes, but you have a share under some conditions for, uh, for the company. We have this uh, initiative uh, now very progressed in uh, Moldova, the so-called Reforma Serele, <laughs> which uh, has... Um, which opens actually these, uh, these opportunities and because we have uh, George here and he, we, with his legal background, just uh, want to know what his uh, view on this and um, what doors uh, will be actually opening with this, uh, with this law for Moldova. Got so excited that my microphone died. No, so thanks for the for the for the question. Actually, and it's an interesting question. I mean, again, if I take you back years ago, right in 2009 when I got here, um, one of the first thing I realized, of course, is that the legal framework in Moldova had been, how shall we say, a little behind behind the times. I remember when we had to. Uh, open the law firm, I had to go to a number of different state agencies to talk to them and I think when I went to the fiscal authorities I had a panel of people ask to become a VAT seller. They were asking me a lot of weird questions like, um, so what do you sell? Well, we're a law firm, we sell legal services. How do you deliver these legal services? Well, via telephone or via email. And there's a weird thing where it came to me that they almost considered everything to be like a sack of apples, right? You give a sack of apples, you get the proces verbal or the, the minutes, and you give it back. And, and there was something that freaked me out a little bit. I was like, wow, there's, a, there's this thing, there's stamps, there's all kinds of little things that really make life very difficult. So, and one of the things that we used to be um, uh, really having a problem when investors would come is, again, the legal framework did not allow for a lot of things that are part of the entrepreneurship uh, economy, right? Things like voting trust agreement or all kinds of way to, you know, like you said, to be able to kind of share, um, you know, issuing share was very cumbersome. Stock options probably were not heard of. There were so many things that, to, that at that time in Silicon Valley were already common knowledge and not just common knowledge, it was kind of like old school, that here didn't exist. So uh, a lot of investors um, would have a hard time setting up a company and organizing it the way they wanted to. Uh, oftentimes they would set up a holding company in, uh, in Netherlands and they would have basically, they would do everything under Dutch law to allow them to split the company or run the company they wanted the way they wanted to. Uh, this has been changing a lot, and as Natalia said, um, the last package of, of, of reforms that was just uh, passed, not sure if Minister Alaiba was here, because he usually would talk a lot, a little more about this, but the last package really brings uh, the framework, the legal framework for entrepreneurship into the 21st century, really. So now uh, investors can set up companies here, not just easy, but you know, um, if before they would have to go to places like Estonia for other reasons, not just the legal framework. Now that challenge is no longer there. So uh, when you want to raise money, when you want to agree with the founders on certain actions and how you actually plan things out, when you want to uh, incentivize um, new employees with different kind of options, um, even as simple as not having the stamp with you, the, you know, the big fat stamp without which nobody would talk to you unless you have fat stamps. Uh, all of those ha are history now. You're actually looking at a framework that is going to change um, the way we invest in Moldova. So, you know, I don't want to get too technical about it, but let's just say that the, the changes that have taken place, especially recently, 
have brought Moldova full in line with uh, most OECD countries, um, even Silicon Valley in some ways, uh, for when it comes to investing in startups, tech company, and just companies in general. Uh, indeed, and um, Georgia pointed out, and Alona and Sergio at the beginning, um, many times the um, uh, people, uh, the people agenda for this uh, sector, and uh, uh, indeed it's a very fast-growing sector. Is the sector with the highest growth rate in the Moldovan economy? We have like an increase of 50, 40, 50 percent every year, so it's really, really booming. Um, Let's see how we uh, pace this, this in terms of uh, talent availability and how we see this from the private sector perspective, just as an uh, investment. I mean, what are the kind of initiatives that you, for instance, Sergio, have at uh, Orange Systems in order to keep the uh, race with this, uh, with this growth? Yeah, Natalia, this is a very important subject. And in fact, uh, ICT talent availability is, uh, is a worldwide subject and Moldova is not an exception. A couple of years ago, uh, the um, gap and shortage was estimated to 2.5. That means that the demand was 2.5 bigger than the existing available resources. And as per my knowledge, this uh, coefficient is even growing. Yeah. But going back to, to your subject, yeah, indeed, the existing uh, and the availability of the talent bring us here today uh, uh, with this growth that we have in the ICT industry. Uh, the point would be what we can do further to continue this growth. Yeah? Um, and uh, what we see here today in Moldova, like all the actors are very well mobilized in, the, in this direction. So we see academia, most of universities already enhance their uh, agenda, curricula, and direction with some ICT topics and uh, domains. Second is public sector. So we see big companies and enterprises already develop a lot of their own internship programs, upskilling, reskilling, career reconversion programs, and the uh, Orange System have a couple of them. So we, we reskill last year more than 300 people. Uh, and together with the support of uh, training centers, same like TechWheel, uh, or Orange Digital Center, this can be supported further. So uh, in May, we open uh, a complete environment called Orange Digital Center that is committed to, to train and skill and upskill and reskill more than 1,000 of, uh, of people in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, but what is also worth to mention is the, the efforts of the MITP with the ATIC and with the government uh, last year to, to open a new, complete new opportunities for, uh, for the industry. It's regarding the IT visa, yeah? So we are not now caged uh, to the employment in the local market. We have the possibility to employ worldwide, what is very preferential in this kind of hybrid and remote working setup that we have today. What's more important than that is that everyone is expecting that AI will bring its contribution uh, uh, to the talent. Uh, and it, frankly speaking, directly from the perspective of the performance, uh, productivity and efficiency of the current resources. And yesterday, uh, I heard in some of, uh, of the panels that uh, it, there is a clear record of 20% increase in productivity of the existing resources. Uh, and I would be happy to acknowledge that this 20% of productivity will be directly reflected in 20% of growth in the ICT industry. Uh, but this will not happen so fast. Yeah? Uh, so that's why the ambition uh, and uh, my advice and in my humble opinion would be uh, to stimulate the companies and stimulate the private sector to orient the, from traditional services, from the simplest outstaffing and outsourcing services, orientation to, to products, to solutions that will bring additional value on top, uh, and that once developed will continue to bring recurrent revenues and increase the, uh, the ICT sector further yeah, and can scale up even much faster. Thank you, thank you, Sergio. Um, just before closing this uh, panel, I would uh, like to thank uh, all the speakers who have been uh, here today. Um, but before that, let's just uh, take the chance and um, um, present or give an advice that would be applicable both to the Moldovan government but to any government in the world in terms of securing the tech investments from your business per perspective. What, in your opinion, the governments should do to achieve this objective? 
Ladies first. Alena, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll, with your permission, I'll uh, allow myself to give an advice, and this is a very usual advice. Before going into IT sector, I was in uh, consulting, in strategy consulting. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, this is an advice coming from all my experience. I had also a chance to look at the digital strategy that was drafted for the upcoming years, digital strategy that was drafted for Moldova. And uh, I can tell you um, it's good, right? It touches all the necessary subjects, it has all the necessary elements, it, has, it, it covers a lot of ground. But also that's a problem, because it's all over the place. It's uh, about this and about that and about that and about that. Uh, this is now not how you achieve something. This is not how you get things done. Uh, in, incorporated, not only, uh, like if we remember Norton and Kaplan, they say you have 10 goals, you will achieve two. You have seven goals, you will achieve three. You have three goals, you will achieve three. So don't put that many goals, focus. Try to find those domains that are most important for your country. And actually today's opening speech, again, from uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Sweden, I was very happy to hear that, and it actually resonates with what I was thinking about. They've chose four directions for their country. They're focusing on those four directions. Why are we, as a small country, all over the place? Why don't we focus also on three directions? Less, let's do less, but let's do them qualitative. And if you ask me, I would focus on sustainable energy, which is obvious. I would focus on agri-tech, which is important for a country that tries to be on the map for, for, for agriculture, and why not export then that solution to other countries. And of course, I would focus on cybersecurity, because we, that could be an advantage for our country and for any country if we can boast that our ecosystem is the safest. Come here, invest here in Moldova, because here your business will be secured from the digital perspective. That's an advantage. It's even more than 7% single tax. It's even more of a simplified reporting and everything. If you tell right now any startup in technology, guys, come here and you are covered, that's amazing. They will come here as startup, as brains, and as investment as well. Yes, my words are mostly for Moldova, but uh, come on, we are in Moldova, and we, I'm thinking about our country, and I do want to see us evolve, and I do want to see us uh, on the map of innovations. I have the ambition to raise the first unicorn in Moldova, and we do need help in doing so. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this opportunity to speak, and hope to see uh, some of the things that we discussed today to see implemented in future in our country and not only. I think it's, um, it's indeed even for the country's uh, learning process, uh, including that with priorities and uh, focus. And I do agree with you that we all need a focus because when you focus on some priorities, then you can uh, get a good, uh, a good, uh, a good result. But also, I noticed that uh, every government can have uh, uh, a very high level of free of charge advisor consultancy in uh, in the business environment. So, just uh, just to take advantage of it, Sergio, uh, Georgi, what would be your short, very short advice? <laughs> yes, I will be very pragmatic. Uh, in fact, for for any business and in any industry, there are two key directions and two key points. Yeah, first of all, about the education. You know, so we are still speaking about talents. Uh, so the education should be a key focus in order to achieve the sustainable growth and uh, continuous growth in any industry. Uh, and the second one is the business environment. Yeah, so the, the security, uh, economical, legal, and uh, all, all kind of the security of operations and the securing of the business investments in Moldova. Yeah. Very short. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief. So one of the things that's actually, I guess it was never spoken here, and sometimes when you talk about laws or policies, you kind of get lost in the dry details. But one of the things that you realize once you come here as an investor in Moldova, uh, tech or anything, but particularly in tech, 
is that you don't just come here, you might think you come here for the great talent or the great availability of talent and whatnot, but as Sergio mentioned when, when he talked about Orange, um, whether you know it or not, you find yourself invested in the country. You find yourself loving the place, the people, the Mamaliga, but just generally the future of the country. And you realize that I don't think there's a single IT company that I personally know that's not doing something outside their business uh, core business to help Moldova, whether it's wiring high schools, you know, in some village or doing something else. There is, this isn't just charity or CSR. This really is being part of the success story. Um, getting back to how the government can probably help with this, because we talked about education, we talked about taking it to the next level. Um, I think right now a lot of these efforts are a little haphazard. I think, uh, you know, I would say, oh, how can I help? I don't have a central place to say what's needed, right? I say, oh, uh, I know this, uh, this, this guy teaches at uh, Gratiash High School. Let me talk to him and see if we can do something at Gratiash High School or something. Uh, my idea is that there's so much goodwill, there's so much willingness to be part of taking to the next level of digital um, alphabetization and not only that it could be uh, helpful if the government could be a more formal partner in some ways or another. And, you know, it, it touches on, you know, PPPs. It touches on a number of things. Uh, again, you do become part of the company, of the country. You feel like you're part of the country. Um, it, it's amazing. It, it, it's a little magic that happened in the background that, again, is not really spoken very much about. Uh, so I think the government could uh, look at this and have some unit that's probably as professional as the IT Parks Administration, someone that you can go to and be able to partner up to fulfill some of the needs, uh, as opposed to trying to go it alone. Um, that's kind of one thought I had. Uh, now I'm thinking that with this question, probably I have the chance to have a second panel with the advices from the government <laughs> to the private sector. <laughs> but uh, altogether, I think, um, and I always used to say that uh, the Moldova has uh, Moldova has a real advantage of being a small country because in small countries, people and organizations are so uh, easily to connect to each other, to talk to each other, and even these sincere discussions that we have, um, I truly believe, and I know that uh, they, um, they uh, end up with, uh, with great results, uh, even those that we have already achieved in the, in the IT sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Ca să, ca să interacționăm. Uh, în pauză, cu să interacționăm. Uh, there, there was a willingness to ask a question. My suggestion is that we ask the questions uh, in, at the networking events, during the, during the events, uh, just because we have a very tight agenda that we would like to follow and stick to. Uh, would like to give a round of applause for Natalia for such a great moderation and for her team who has um, talked about the opportunities uh, and the Moldovan market. Our next speaker uh, comes uh, also from the Nordic countries. Uh, we'll have a keynote provided by Carl Anders Grönland, who is a lawyer and chairman of um, a law firm and many IT companies. He will talk about that. I'm not sure we have a video that will uh, start in between or we just move, but we need to change the setup. So once uh, it's starting, Carl, you're invited on stage. Thank you.
Thank you so much for welcoming me to Moldova. I'm uh, going to, um, I, I was, um, I have three parts, three ways I will see this through. Uh, I'm a chairman of a law firm, like it was said, that did international contracts, and that brought me to Moldova for the first time. The first time I actually came to Moldova was in 2006. Uh, you hear me well? Yeah. Uh, 2006. And the reason for that was actually that we were starting a digitalization in Norway. So my first meeting was with, um, was to, was with uh, Teleradio Moldova because Norway was going to give the first bus for TV production to Moldova and um, it, it couldn't be given back so you come back to Europe because we're going to digitalization buses. And at that time, Moldova didn't have any digitized buses in their TV and it felt like it was totally back. Uh, today, I'm standing here at the digital summit and it shows me a country that has moved a far away. My background is that I'm a chairman of, 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 um, of, of a law firm, but I'm also the only one in the whole world that is a chairman of listed technology companies in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark at the, whole time, at the same time. And I'm also the chairman of the small and medium-sized uh, companies in association of companies in Norway. What is important here is that, like one of the, one of, one of the panels said earlier, I'm not a technologist, but Building a company in ICT sector is about three things. Three things only. It's about having the right product and business idea. And I'm actually coming from the country that invented the mobile phone. Has anybody heard about mobile phones from Norway? No. That was Nokia Finnish. It was Ericsson Swedish. And the reason for that was not because Norwegian didn't have the capacity to do it. We invented it, we tried it out. It was because we didn't have the infrastructure when it comes to capital and building the growth of the mobile industry. And this is like, like the, what, I will what I want to talk about a little because when we are talking about building industry, you need all things together. You don't only need a legal framework, you don't only need the, the, um, the understanding of how to deal with it, but you need to have a capital environment that is working on it. So you have all the things together. That's why Sweden's industry, and I, I can also represent Sweden because my biggest listed company is in Sweden. And uh, the size of the ITT market in Sweden is 10 times bigger. Not only because they have used the money in the R&D, because we're doing that in Norway as well, but because they have the technical and the financial structures that is much more developed than Norway. Norway is a country based on oil, fish, and, um, and gas, but it's not in the same when it comes to um, technology. So that's why, for instance, me as a, as a Norwegian chairman, move my companies to Sweden. That's why I move my companies to Denmark. And this is what Moldova has to avoid, because then you also move the capacity on the financial and the legal structures. So coming here, I see the same country that we were in Norway like 10 or 15 years ago when we started to actually build this structure for having the financial. And this is the thing, I mean, this has been a very, very good summit. But these are the things we need to talk about is how we made the whole infrastructure. Because building it in Moldova, building using 3%, for instance, on uh, making the right right inventions, the right thing doesn't help if it's not stays in Moldova, and the Moldovan people get it. And all companies are global, but they always have a home where you have the management, where you have the knowledge. And I'm doing this, I'm, I'm the chairman, not only countries like, like Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, I'm, the, I'm also sharing companies in Africa and United States. They are not listed, so they are not on the list here. But it's always about where the infrastructure and where you have all the people. Uh, I would be happy to ask any questions about this. Uh, I, I, one of the, that's one of the reasons why we yesterday signed an agreement with a lot of the organizations in Moldova. I'm not going to mention them all by name because that will take time. But it's actually about trying to help in, in getting the knowledge about actually developing them from a startups to grow-ups. 
because every company starts with two or three people, but you always want them in the end to end like big companies with uh, at least four digit number of employees. And this is what, what I think we need to focus on because I was walking around looking at all the companies. There's a lot of companies here that has, seems to have a big potential. I don't really know because I haven't dived, dived, looked into them. But this is where we hope that we can work together and we have to do that to get the companies that have gone the journey before. That's what it's about because you, you can learn about it, you can read about it, but you still have to experience it. I, uh, I look around and it's like what really impresses me also in Moldova. It was talking about gender equality. I've only met women actually so far leading the, the organizations, which is kind of unusual for me, which makes me a little like, wow, this is something we have to learn about in Norway. In Norway, we have in all the technology companies, we are, qu we are quotes of directors that are women. So it shall be never 40% and less than gender. Obviously, I, I as a man would have, been, have to come in by the gender equality because there seems to be women everywhere. So that's a good sign, uh, but it's also telling you that in many ways, there are things here that is in front of the rest of the world because going to the United States, it doesn't feel like that. Going to Nigeria, where I'm, where I'm sitting in the joint venture with the government, it definitely doesn't feel like that. Then I feel like the only one, that there I don't see any women at all. So I mean, this is something that has impressed me on, on these journeys, actually how far you've gotten gender equality, but maybe it's just a facade, I don't know, but basically it's kind of impressive. I'm also really impressed about going to the summit, and also this in much in front of what you actually see in the rest of the world, it's actually how, how digitalized the perspective is on the people talking. I mean, everybody is digitalized. Everybody say they are digitalized, but it's not like that at all. And the kind look listening to here today and yesterday, we are just, you're just jumping by two, 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 um, two rounds of it. So, so from a Scandinavian and from a Norwegian perspective, it's very good. But what I will underline and what is a really important thing for me is never forget that the IT technology is not a specific sector. There's no sector that doesn't have the ICT in it. And uh, ICT doesn't live a life world of, or without it because you have to have the whole infrastructure. It's like everybody had what comes from the government, everybody had. But you have to bring in the investors in and every investor coming in is thinking about the exit. The first thing an investor asks is how I'm going to get out if I'm investing. Which means that you have to have the whole environment of actually different. No investor go, go in without having a way to sell themselves out and they will also look for two or three. So, so in my mind, I hope, and this is my advice, if I'm allowed to give so to, to the next uh, digital summit, it's actually about capital structures and not about the law, but also about actually how you deal with it because this will be the next hurdle. Norway didn't manage in the same way like Sweden. We are the same people, we are the, we are the same country. In many ways, we were, we are, people are moving and they're educated everywhere, but they managed to make a market that investments and that's why if you look for, for, for the people making business, the valuation is much higher in Sweden of the same companies like in Norway still, even if there's the same investors both places. And why? So uh, this is this is how hope will be a subject, and also for for every for all investors going in. I really hope uh, every, the trade between Norway and Sweden will come into to the IT sector. It's uh, anything but zero. And that's why it's kind of impressive that I was invited here in the first place to try to do something about it. I mean, being the chairman of three listed companies that outsourced to Ukraine, all of them, Moldova was never on the agenda. And that's what I want to change. Because it's safer, it's uh, better, but Norway has more IT employees outside Norway than inside Norway. And I don't think outsourcing is the right answer because outsourcing 
you have to also that people have to be global, but you also have to have partners in every country you go into. And there is nothing, there is no reason except from knowledge about Moldova, actually telling about the country. There was a very good, good advisor earlier, and I'm not going to pick on all the details, but it's just about awareness. It's about awareness. Everybody has to know what Moldova has to offer. And if I can, I hope we all together can do something about that. I'm quite sure that there will be business down here because that's what it's all about. So with that, kind, with that conclusion that we have all together a good job to do up front, I, I will stop my speech here. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now or at any time later today. So. I don't need that one, <laughs> but uh, I'll take it. Uh, thank you, Carl Anders, for your wonderful uh, uh, keynote and the speech uh, on uh, ingredients uh, to do business uh, in Moldova and what we need to work on. We continue with uh, one of the panels, uh, kindly arranged and provided with the support of uh, our colleagues from GIZ. Um, on Eastern Partnership Digital Trends, uh, I will invite after the small uh, break, uh, meaning the video online, uh, not the small break to, to leave the, <laughs> the, um, the room, um, Anatoly Motkin, uh, the founder and president of Strategist, uh, to chair the session, and with him, Thibault Charlet, program manager of digital economy development within the European Commission, Dmitry Gugunava, Chief Manager of Digital Governance um, at Digital Governance Agency in Georgia, uh, Shahin Aliyev, uh, Advisor to CEO, uh, Innovation and Digital Development Agency in Azerbaijan, Aneta Babayan, Partnership and Portfolio Information System Agency of Armenia, and Vitaly Tarlev, Digitalization Advisor in the Economic Council to the uh, Prime Minister's Office uh, of Moldova. Thank you. Uh, blown away always by 3D holograms. I think they're fantastic. And I've learned all sorts of interesting things. And I think it's got a real buzz. It's really great. It's wonderful. There's a lot of food and with a lot of technology companies actually in one place. People have to understand these technologies. And to the extent that GoTech World is bringing large numbers of people to come and listen to speakers who are then educating them about these technologies. It was great to see so many peers uh, and it was not only about one specific topic but it was about robotic, NFTs, metaverse, e-commerce, so very broad and that was uh, extremely insightful. This is something that actually continues on a regular basis. And the people here are super nice and I met a lot of smart people that made some incredible questions after my keynote. So come to Bucharest and come to GoTech World.
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Anatoly Motkin. I'm president of Strategist, and Strategist is a leading independent institution developing digital economy in Eurasian countries. And it's a, a big honor for me to be here uh, to moderate this panel uh, about the uh, digital transformation in European uh, Eastern Partnership countries. And uh, all the uh, participants here uh, and our distinguished guests have uh, extensive experience in digital transformation and uh, digital reforms in uh, their respective countries. So first, uh, let me present uh, our speakers. Uh, Vitaly Tarlev, a digi a digitalization advisor at, uh, in the Economic Council uh, to the Prime Minister of Moldova, and the project is supported by EBRD. Mr. Talev is an accomplishing professional in the field of informational technology and communications. He has held significant roles, including State Secretary for Information Technology and Electronic Communications, Deputy Minister of Information Technology and Communications, and Director for European Integration and International Cooperation within the Ministry of IT&C. Mr. Talev has played a pivotal role in numerous national and international initiatives, focusing on information society policies digitalization projects and strategic developments such as EU Moldova Association Agreements Information Society Chapter, has yes, spearheaded key projects such as the creation of the first Moldova IT Virtual Park, the implementation of mandatory digital education and Moldova cybersecurity program. Dmitry Gugunava, a, a digital governance agency operating under the Ministry of uh, Justice of uh, Georgia, Dmitry Gugunava has more than 12 years of work experience in the public service, now working as a chief manager of digital governance and cybersecurity strategic directions, where he covers the policy, legal, and international relations issues in both domains, digital governance and cybersecurity. Aneta Babayan, PhD in economics, a partnerships and portfolio coordination Armenia Information Systems Agency. Information Systems Agency of Armenia is a recently established institution with the mandate of managing the digital transformation reforms of the country under the strategic leadership of the Digital Board. Aneta Babayan is a senior public policy manager with over 22 years of experience in economic development, strategic planning, and public administration. Currently, she manages partnerships and projects at the Armenian Information Systems Agency, Foundation supporting the CEO and the Deputy Prime Minister, CIO. Previously, she served as an advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister, leading Armenia's public administration reform strategy. With a background in economics, she holds a PhD from Yerevan State University and has received a recognition for her dedications, uh, dedicated service, including the Minister of Economy Certificate of uh, Gratitude and Prime Minister Medal. Shahin Aliyev. Advisor to CEO, Innovation and Digital Development Agency in Azerbaijan. Shahin Aliyev is an accomplished professional with expertise in computer science, business administration, and the telecom sector. With extensive experience as the chief technology officer within a leading mobile operator, he successfully managed large-scale transformation projects and demonstrated a strong aptitude for driving organizational changes and innovation. In his recent role as a head of the National CERT and Personal Data Protection Authority, Shahin gained valuable insights into cybersecurity and privacy matters. Currently, he is actively involved in digitalization efforts as part of the Innovation and Digital Development Agency, focusing on citizen-centric digital government services, SME digitalization, digital academy, digital IT, data-driven government, interoperability and data governance. And the last and not the least, Thibaut Chalet, Program Manager at DigiNear European Commission. Mr. Chalet has been working for the Directorate General for Neighborhood in enlargement negotiations of the European Commission for four years and a half. And he is currently working in the unit responsible for the implementation of an ambitious economic and investment plan for the region and is currently in charge of managing the EU for Digital initiative. The initiative was launched in 2016 by the ministers in charge of the digital transformation in the Eastern Partnership countries and by the European Commission. It is the main umbrella grouping all regional programs funded by the EU 
which support the digital transformation of economies and societies in the region. And now to the, uh, to the essence. Uh, uh, Vitaly, I will ask you as a hosting party. Uh, you have, we know each other for many years and uh, you have extensive experience in working on uh, developing the digital agenda and the digital infrastructure, knowledge uh, infrastructure in Moldova. How would you describe the importance and the essence of the bilateral relations between Moldova and EU in digital sphere? Well, uh, quite an unexpected question for this format, uh, but nevertheless, let, my, uh, let me uh, give some, uh, some uh, uh, thoughts on, on this. Uh, I consider that uh, the EU agenda and cooperation of EU institutions in different formats was crucial for Moldova to uh, reinvent its uh, uh, digital path, to, to reinvent its uh, digital industries and uh, the success of uh, IT industry. ICT industry here in Moldo Moldova is obvious and we are moving to the next level, uh, exceptionally uh, with the support of uh, EU directly or indirectly, indirectly in building uh, those uh, or bringing those building blocks here in Moldova. And uh, uh, initially, uh, in stability pact format, when no one in Moldova knew what to do at the next level in Moldova, uh, EU institutions gave us a very interesting list. Guys, you should have a strategy, you, have, you should uh, liberalize uh, the telco market, guys, you should think about uh, Budapest Convention, uh, uh, about uh, Convention on uh, Data Protection, and uh, to, to, to build your trust services, meaning uh, uh, root certification authority, and that's on. Uh, we did that uh, actually very fast, and in a format of uh, Southeastern European countries, uh, that was a clear agenda for countries like Moldova, to start to build this path in, uh, uh, to, in, in, this, uh, in this way. So uh, the next stage was association agreement when we had enough freedom to build our own experience like IT parks or like other components. But at the same time, we were following a clear direction how to move Moldova closer to you digital market how to integrate it in, uh, in uh, those common uh, trains, and it also worked. At that point, uh, I was uh, still working in, uh, in public sector, and uh, it really worked. Uh, at the point when we signed the, the association agreement, I remember that we already succeeded to implement all the information society chapter in Moldova because we negotiated it in uh, 2010. and 2015, we almost did. The agreement was signed in 2015. So we had a time to um, find our new local initiatives and uh, it was very interesting at the same time. The most visible projects were uh, actually not those inspired from EU practice, but those inspired from uh, practices in other emerging regions, especially for IT Park, actually that was the experience from Asia, from Singapore, from uh, Republic of Korea and, and other, uh, other uh, countries, we had almost the same experience what we had in 2014, 15, when we used to have about four or five governments during one year. And in that period of time, EU experience was interesting, but we were looking for something more challenging. Now we are in the third stage, and this is a very interesting stage, uh, when uh, uh, we have an uh, uh, a candidacy, a candidacy statute, and uh, the agenda is, uh, is uh, still uh, um, in the process of, uh, uh, or in construction. Uh, but nevertheless, the EU path uh, for Moldova uh, as a country and uh, digitalization or digital market, digital services markets, uh, those uh, uh, objectives which Moldova follows and uh, uh, I can say it's my personal impression that uh, government uh, almost did it part of the job 
uh, EU institutions are there to support us, especially uh, through uh, EU for digital instruments. Uh, but we have to think more about uh, building uh, digital economy ecosystem. And I think you should support more on this. Uh, we have a few big uh, achievements uh, with EU support this year in Moldova. This is cybersecurity legislation, first of all. And uh, I would continue on this path, but we need more common activities and we need EU support. So let me uh, see that this is my contribution to, to setting up new trends and new, new objectives. This is uh, uh, about trust services. This is about DMA DSA. Uh, and this is about digital economy in, in, in European manner. So uh, let's, let's continue the same path because this is very uh, supportive, very uh, uh, fruitful. And uh, uh, here in uh, ICT supporting uh, community in Moldova, we are very thankful for, for uh, this format of cooperation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. And uh, uh, Dimitri, I would like to ask you, when we talk about digital transformation, it's a very generic term, and there are many paths to achieve maybe even the same goal, and I would like to uh, would ask you to share your expertise and your experience in Georgia from Georgian perspective. What should be the paths to achieve this digital transformation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I have pr prepared a short presentation of, of, of six, seven minutes, if I may, if, it, if this one works. No, it doesn't. Now it does. Okay, now. Just to control myself, I shall start my stopwatch. Uh, uh, very strange title of the presentation, right? So, waiting for the soul. Uh, just random thoughts on the path of digital transformation based on the experience that we got in Georgia. I'm not going to speak about the uh, s s successful decades of digital transformation of Georgia. There's a book, by the way, on, on that topic I can share with the public later. This is just... Uh, uh, a try of, of deeper understanding of the topic. And uh, while talking about digital transformation, uh, we should firstly um, uh, agree whether this is uh, the journey of the country, uh, whether this is a matter of science or a matter of uh, philosophy. And uh, there is a one, one quote, then my presentation is full of quotes because uh, I do like using other, other people's uh, other people's work, not to reinventing bicycles. And I think that's very crucial if you want to have a good digital transformation, not to reinvent the bicycles. Uh, and there's a quote that says that uh, when something happens and it bothers us, it's a matter of science, and if something doesn't happen and doesn't bother us, it's a matter of philosophy. And uh, while talking about digital transformation, personally for myself, uh, I, I think of a lot of things that happen and bother, bothers me, and a lot of things that, that doesn't happen and it doesn't bother me. So for me, it's, it's a matter of both, science and philosophy. And uh, I think that we must answer uh, one fundamental, fundamental question. And the question is as follows, that what are the questions that we should answer? And uh, this is just an idea, just three simple questions. Where we stand, where are we now? where we want to get to, and how to get there. And just to follow these questions, uh, uh, here is the, the first one, where we stand. This is another quote from uh, Thomas Terence Eliot, the fantastic man, I think. This is the man uh, who was the first one who said that, uh, who, who created the ground for saying that we are now living in the uh, information age. And uh, Thomas Terence Eliot said that Where's the life that we have lost in living? And where's the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where's the knowledge we have lost in information? So if we can say, uh, if I may, I can say that we live also based on the fantastic presentations from yesterday, uh, the presentations on a AI and this emerging text. We live in the wonderland, the wonderland of information-based technologies. And uh, the, when we say wonderland, uh, the first thing that comes to our mind is, is who? Is Alice, right? Uh, who, who is in the Wonderland and wants to get, get out of there. And when, when she uh, meets the Cheshire cat, she, she asks the question, how shall I get out of here? Uh, and the cat answers that, that depends uh, on a good deal on where you want to go 
and uh, the answer is I don't really care much where I want to go and the cat answers that then it doesn't really matter where which way you want to go. So if we don't have a clear understanding what the future looks like or what is the uh, point where we want to get to, it doesn't really matter how these uh, new technologies will evolve, whether they will be secure or not. It's just our idea that technology should be secure, this digital transformation should look like that, but if we don't answer the fundamental question, is this the a uh, very precise description of the future that we want to get to, then it doesn't really matter which, what path we shall say, choose, what strategies we shall have, how we shall implement the technologies and so on. And, uh, but I, I'm not going to give you uh, some ideas because I don't have any to, to answer the question where we want to go, but I think every nation, it's about culture and it's about uh, uh, individuals to, to make a choice where, uh, where is the path of this nation? Where is the path of this, this country, this particular country? And, uh, but, but I want to jump to the next question. How to get out from here? Because we know that status quo is not enough and uh, there is a lot of things that, that have a potential to be better. We, we, there's a potential to, to live better, to live more secure way and so on. And how to get out from here? And uh, to answer this question, I uh, like to dig down in the, in the wisdom part because we all share the, the old books. Uh, now it's written in Georgian because it's a Georgian Proverbs and Sayings, but, but, but you all do have access to your own culture's Proverbs and Sayings. And when we're talking about the wisdom, this is where you can find some. Uh, and one of the Georgian Proverbs says that Cunning is better than force if a man uh, is ingenious. And uh, this is about not reinventing the bicycle. This is about sharing other countries' experience, uh, some other, to, to listen to someone else who has maybe thought a, a bit longer about the topic that you are going to solve in your country. And uh, here is another quote from, the, from Pablo Picasso that says that, Good artists copy and great artists steal. This is a favorite quote of Steve Jobs, by the way. And, and mine too, because Steve Jobs' quotes are also my favorite ones. And uh, yeah, we can copy, but, uh, but we can also steal in, in a good way. The f one fundamental thing that we may come up to based on the wisdom that we have is that we find out one day that everything works in a very same way and works in the, on, based on the very same principles. And no matter you are the manager of the chicken factory or the IT company or the law firm. And all these things based on the experience of Georgia is based on three fundamental things. You have to create a great product, you have to create a great marketing, you have to create a great delivery. The great marketing is about creating the wheel for someone to want something, the great product. And great delivery is about fulfilling these demands. This is how we th see this uh, topic and how we, and what, this is the approach that we have in digital transformation in Georgia. And uh, what does the great product look like? Okay, I shall not talk too much about how the education is important, uh, how design should be simple, or focus on the experience that you have, or others do have, or innovate or die. We all know what these great products may look like, and uh, there are fantastic books on that. And what uh, gr great marketing look like. I can tell you a fantastic joke in Georgian, but if it is Georgian and you don't understand Georgian language, then it doesn't really uh, make any sense for you, right? So you won't laugh on that unless you understand Georgian. And technologies also require the very specific language to communicate to the citizens or businesses or customers, as you may call. And uh, the, the marketing is not about packaging something. The marketing is about creating a wish to use some services, to, to be on the same boat of digital transformation. And what about the great delivery? Okay, the, the diversification of the channels, the targeting the audience, sometimes be a sniper, sometimes use a shotgun, analyze the sales and so on. And what is Georgian experience on that? For example, we do have public service halls and physical 
areas of public service delivery. We do have mobile public service also, mini buses, where you can uh, access uh, the all public services which is available in public service source. We do have online channels like MyGovG and ProBox, uh, which, is, which is for probationers to, uh, to make registration on a daily basis. A mobile application on MyGovG and personal assistant because sometimes people need a human being to talk to. And we have uh, this fall coming, uh, the project, the personal assistant for the paid service for businesses. And, uh, but based on all this, other than all this, excuse me, you, you have to have a, a right mindset. You don't have to be the first, but you, you should want to be the best. And here is another quote of one uh, American stand-up stand -up comedian, which, which is my favorite, from Stephen Wright. Uh, the early bird may get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Right? It's, it's, it, I, I laughed a lot when I, when I read it. It's, it's true. Uh, because wanting to be the first one may not always lead you to be the best, but uh, usually, the, the second mouse is get the cheese. And here is one more thing. This is a quote from the Steve Jobs, by the way. One more thing. This is a quote of Steve Jobs. Yeah. And uh, this is a very short story about all old Indians. And one Indian was running from one village to another, and he was very tired and went to the, uh, to the, under the and rested under the uh, shadow of the tree. And another one, a man comes and what are you doing? And he says that uh, I'm waiting for my soul. Uh, and other than getting some energy from the trees, because all the Indians believe that touching the tree, uh, and by the way, Moldova tree, the tree of knowledge, tree of, okay, tree of life, and it's very uh, connected to this event. Uh, he said that I was running so fast that I, that, that my soul is very far behind, so I'm waiting for my soul. And uh, other than that getting energy from the personal relationships in the, in the events like this, and family and friends and everything, uh, our experience says, the Georgian experience says that sometimes you should just, just stop under the shadow of the tree and wait for your soul. And the soul is something in the proverbs of, of your nation. Maybe even under the tree of life, maybe under the tree of knowledge. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Annette, uh, the next question is addressed to you. And uh, Armini is quite an uh, interesting case in all this um, um, region as uh, one of the first champions in digital uh, sphere. And many things that happened positively in Armenia. Uh, were made thanks to the enormous contribution of the uh, diaspora. Uh, and uh, we're talking to the, today about the digital transformation, and I would like also to see many countries, even in your region, like Georgia, also made some uh, many steps towards the digital transformation, especially during the last two, three years. How do you see Armenia competitive, and also what is the unique way of Armenia in digital transformation, please? Hello? Ah, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the question and uh, for, the, for the colleagues to setting up the background for my speech uh, and Dimitri, very insightful, inspirational presentation. And um, the unique way of Armenia. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to have a confession to the uh, audience. I didn't have chat GTP to design my speech and uh, try to be authentic, uh, maybe old-minded in a way uh, in these days. Um, authentic. This is actually maybe the key word that uh, countries can rely on in building their way of digital transformation because uh, when we think about reforms, um, transformational paths that the world and in information era, in the open space, that when the knowledge across boundaries move faster, so fast, 
and information across boundaries and countries move so fast, uh, actually uh, you find you in a, in, a, uh, in a situation when everybody talks the same language across globe and across continents and across countries. And what, is, what makes countries be unique, be competitive, uh, be maybe first runners or leapfrog, uh, have some leapfrog from the uh, general pattern that's happening um, in, um, in a given certain, given, certain given time span. So maybe this is the authenticity and how to do things. Maybe the whole secret is hidden in the way countries make this transformation. So regarding Armenia, I would maybe uh, highlight that you mentioned that we have a long journey on digital, digitization, uh, on electronic services making, but this journey started long ago, even be before 2000, and even in the uh, first electronic solutions and digital solutions, in the government sector appeared back in late 19s when across the government uh, there was a digital document flow in, in the introduced etc etc a very challenging and behavioral change that that triggered behavioral change in the government but what we say now it's not about changing the government it's about whole of the society and whole of the economy digital transformation. So we shift from the, we did the paradigm shift building on our uh, experience, uh, failures as well, and learning path. And we are now talking about shifting the paradigm from e-gov to e-society and building e-economy. And what does in practical uh, terms means this? Uh, paradigm shift is that we do not talk about IT solutions, we talk about citizen and customer satisfaction. So, and we are not talking about uh, around technology and we talk about emotions of the citizens when they use the product and the outcomes of these technologies and the services that are available online. So in recent survey made by, uh, I don't remember who, made, who, who was behind the survey, that the most successful countries in service delivery and digital transformation actually the, the one of the key indicators was the emotional experience of customers when using services. This is what we will target for. And our quantitative target is that by 2025, we actually aim at one million citizens actively using the electronic services and EID solutions. So, and when we talk about citizen experience, actually, in digitalization of services and public services, usually we make statements like, like uh, there are, uh, for example, certain percentage of public services available online. So we want to shift from this saying to what percentage of citizens and customers are satisfied with the availability of digital services and, and their virtual life. So this is the paradigm shift. And we also want to measure success uh, built on how the trust between the government and citizens has been rebuilt to, to renew the trust building process because in digital era, in information era, we, we see that there, the, the, the grounds of this trust building relationship and social construct is a bit of, uh, uh, is challenged a bit when it comes from, for, 
data protection, personal data, cybersecurity issues, etc. So another challenging thing would be how to rebuild the trust between citizens, businesses, and, and, and the state. Uh, and we uh, focus on this uh, issue a lot. Uh, when we talk about also how to build this digital transformation, uh, I would maybe concentrate more not on successes that we achieved so far and what we are do doing now, because I would just replicate the storyline of many previous speakers and the Moldovan experience as well, because every country is doing like eGov platforms, e-services, national services platform, mobile applications, one-stop shops in mobile and uh, electronic platforms for services, etc. But I want to concentrate my speech more on the challenges and how we see, because nobody speaks about challenges, uh, um, uh, talking about digital transformation. One critical challenge is how to manage how to manage the pressure of uh, political um, I mean wish to have quick wins versus thinking strategically. For example, if you want some services go like release online. So it's a quick win for the politics for the government, for the authorities. But then you lose the strategic side, the visionary moment of it. And you lose the side that digital transformation is a journey to, in, to building innovation nation. So to build roots and potential for innovation. And when you lose the side, you end up uh, in emerging when your opportunities and potential are not uh, actually scaled up enough so that the private sector is enabled and people are enabled more to, to build creative and innovative societies and open societies. Another challenge would be how to build champions in the society and champions in the government as well. Because we all know when there is technology, then there is t uh, transformation. Governments as a very bureaucratic institutions, and it's, it's the same across the world. Uh, one country more developed institutionally, less developed institutionally, but the same issue. Governments move slower than the society, than the technology, than the economy. How to bridge this gap so that the government move, move in a pace that enable this digital transformation. And in case of Armenia, we, there are many models countries adopted uh, building their digital transformation path. For example, I would be Singapore creating a central institution that will build digital solutions and make the country's digital transformation from some central authority. Armenian case is that because we declared democracy building is our chosen path, democracy, and building democratic institutions across the government, vertically and horizontally, is also, also critical for us. So we build uh, digital transformation also builds on these values. And we try to make institutions empower, strengthen their capacities, so that each and every institution is, an, is the owner, political owner of the services and digital products and the transformation path that it follows. And nobody uh, comes and digitalize the set of services that this is, this is under mandate of this institution. So the, this comes to say that digital transformation should come in parallel with other reforms because it will fail if it, does, it is not supported uh, with 
uh, a broader and large scale public sector reforms, institutional rebuilding, workforce reforms, etc. Another thing, cybersecurity, a challenging thing. We need to wrap and, up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and, and we are currently trying to build the national CERT also, and we meet this challenge that globally, a cyber talent is so restricted and demand is growing. So another challenge would be how to build the future workforce for the country, and not only on cybersecurity, but for, to support this digital future. We need to think what we do now, actually, we build the roots and potential for the future generation. This is the headline. And I would maybe a f uh, final some sentence that will maybe highlight what Armenia pursues and how we, what is the philosophy behind our digital transformation path is maybe uh, I'll bring Winston Churchill's uh, quote that success is not final, never. Success never is final. Like failure is not fatal. And uh, actually what is the most critical is the courage to continue after each failure. So we learn on our failures and also on your perspectives and your, your experience a lot. And thank you for this opportunity a lot. Thank you, Annette. And I, I absolutely agree with you that the, the key for any digital transformation is all these reforms to be human-centric and, and not bureaucrat-centric as it was being done for the uh, last years. And, uh, you know, a Minister of Oil of Saudi Arabia was quoted saying that the Stone Age came to its end not because we were out of stones. The same with oil. And uh, I will ask you <laughs> about the Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan was perceived or is perceived as the wealthiest per capita country in Eastern Partnership region. And maybe that was actually the blocker for digital transformation for many years in the country. We know that President Aliyev signed this year the special tax regime for IT industry, but when we're talking about digital transformation, it's not only about the IT industry, it's about the overall transformation. So how does it look like from your side, from Baku? Thank you, Anatolia. Uh, maybe, maybe you all heard about that, but I want to repeat it once more, that uh, digital transformation is not about the technology, it's more about the people. You need to have people uh, who understand that uh, digital transformation, who has alignment uh, of digital uh, alignment of the vision, uh, and also people who have enough skills and motivation to use the digital services. Uh, and uh, it's not only about the government, uh, you need to have uh, citizen involvement, business involvement, and also government involvement in this digitalization uh, efforts. We are lucky that we have uh, good relations, collaboration in between government agencies, government organizations. That's why we did, uh, we completely, uh, we completed many uh, projects in digitalization and we think that we already completed first phase or era of the digitalization in Azerbaijan. This year we started new phase of digitalization. What we did until now, uh, we have more than uh, 100 uh, platforms in government, including uh, more than 20 uh, customer-facing applications, including uh, web and mobile applications. We have uh, base registries in, in place. We have three different uh, data sharing platforms, uh, one, two for G2G, uh, one for uh, G2B. Uh, we have a single sign-on platform, uh, we have if e signature uh, trust infrastructure, uh, mature trust infrastructure, we have uh, legal framework in place including personal data protection law, uh, cyber security law, governance framework, and also uh, we have other uh, systems. We have, to get, today we have colleagues uh, of mine from the different government agencies uh, Chanan and Mehdi, they are pilots of the digitalization in our country and they are the founder of uh, several uh, uh, critical uh, systems, let's say. And what we are planning to do uh, as a next step, uh, uh, we have several, uh, we have identified several key pillars for digital transformation. These are, the, as I said before, 
something wrong with this <laughs> slide. Okay, uh, it's about uh, digital government, digital society, uh, digital business, uh, infrastructure, uh, and innovation ecosystem. Uh, and when we select the projects, uh, we are looking at initially to our uh, strategy, to our vision. If there are some projects uh, that ca that can be considered as a quick win and it's aligned with the, uh, our vision and strategy, we uh, prefer to go to run this uh, quick win uh, project. Otherwise, we have uh, long-term uh, plans and projects. Let me uh, give some brief information about uh, these uh, strategic projects. Uh, we are uh, currently running a project to create a super app for e-government uh, services. Uh, and uh, we will launch it in September, early se September. Its uh, first version is already ready and tested in different organizations. Uh, we have another project for business, uh, SME, it's called SME Digitalization. We have partners, uh, international partners, local partners, we work uh, associations, uh, banks and other organizations to help uh, small and medium enterprises uh, make uh, all the process digital. We are, we are developing a, um, a platform which is called Digital Library. In this library, all the businesses can find uh, different tools and solutions applicable for their business. Also, they can uh, conduct self-assessment. They can measure the maturity level of their uh, organization for, of, for, the, for the digitalization. Uh, we, we provide incentives for the uh, SMEs and IT organizations to come uh, to, to meet in this platform. Well, uh, also, we have uh, IT uh, relocation uh, projects. Uh, at the same time, we have changed our legislation recently. We have zero tax incentives. If you become a member of the Technopark, you pay zero tax for employment. So you pay zero tax for, for the income ta tax. Uh, another important project is about the document exchange. We, are uh, we already built a document exchange. All the document exchange between government agencies are electronic. Now the next phase is uh, about exchanging documents between governments, cross-border uh, cross uh, document exchange, and uh, maybe one of the uh, first uh, projects we can uh, start with Moldova. Uh, and uh, we have uh, projects regarding uh, uh, law and regulation. They are digital code. We already prepared the digital code, uh, uni unified uh, law for digitalization, covering all aspects of the digitalization. We have AI strategy developed. We have data governance framework coming soon. Uh, also, uh, cybersecurity is important part of the dig digitalization. That's why we uh, last year we established cybersecurity, Azerbaijan Cybersecurity Center, together with uh, Technion University of uh, Israel. All the trainers are coming from Israel to Azerbaijan to train our local uh, expert experts. Also, the, uh, the train the train. We are working with the train the trainer model. They are preparing local trainees. Uh, except the uh, professionals, we, are, we have uh, another scope within this center. We are preparing national cybersecurity solutions. And uh, also we have a TECNES program for uh, capacity building. It's a scholarship program. Till end of this year, we are planning to prepare more than 3,000 IT specialists. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Shaheen. And uh, to you, Thibault. We're sitting on this stage because Mr. Sikorsky and Mr. Bild once initiated Eastern Partnership. And uh, it works perfectly in different layers. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the initiatives is also integration of Eastern Partnership digital infrastructure into digital single market uh, and, and many others. And I would address a question to you. Like, the question about digital single market is, is very technical issue. But you also work on public partner public-private partnership to fund the digital transformation in this region. And that's something that would be of great interest for us to listen how do you, how do you see it and how it works. Please. Thank you so much, Natalie, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, panel, and congratulations for the event. It's, it's very impressive. 
Um, well, I'm, um, as you said in the introduction, the, the program manager for the EU for Digital Initiative. And this is our um, main umbrella, channeling all the EU regional um, programs supporting digital transformation in the Eastern Partnership. So we cover a wide range of areas and it's extremely interesting to hear about the different developments in the countries. Um, I would like to start by um, just tracing out the policy background uh, for our cooperation with the partners. We have um, a joint agenda uh, which was agreed between the European Commission, the European Union and the Eastern Partnership uh, countries back in 2021. And this agenda was reviewed um, in December 2022, um, of course, taking into account uh, the consequences of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and also the historical decisions of the European Council to grant the candidate status to Ukraine, to Moldova, and to grant the European perspective to Georgia. And the conclusion of this review uh, for the Eastern Partnership was first, the Eastern Partnership is a very relevant cooperation platform to address common challenges across the region. And it is especially true in the area of digital transformation because internet has no borders. And uh, we've seen today that uh, the challenges are quite the same. Um, the second conclusion was that we need to focus on uh, tailor-made cooperation to best address the needs of the partners and that the enlargement track should be complementary with the regional approach, uh, and we will see how this is possible. Now, um, besides the policy background, I would like to give um, a few reflections to answer your question, Anatoly. So in the European Commission, we are supporting the partners uh, in two ways. First, uh, we have policy targets, which have been agreed um, among the partners and, uh, in this agenda, and we have investment targets. For the policy targets, we are uh, following the EU's vision for a resilient digital transformation, so we are guided by the four cardinal points of the EU digital compass. Um, so we are working on digital infrastructure and the common target is to um, have at least 80% of citizens connected via affordable and high speed internet uh, across the region. We are also working to lower roaming tariffs um, across the region and with the European Union uh, when feasible. The second pillar is on digital governance and here we have common targets also to increase the exchange of uh, electronically signed documents, to work on the mutual recognition of digital signatures, and um, a very ambitious one, but I think extremely, extremely relevant, is the development of dig digital transport corridors uh, to link the region um, with the EU in a seamless manner. We, this, the third pillar in terms of policy targets is on digital economy and digital innovation and skills. Um, so we want to increase e-commerce um, with the region. Also um, to empower digitally at least one million uh, citizens in the next years. So it's, um, we will need uh, the support of the governments, of course and to um, build the startup uh, ecosystem. And I will explain how we will deliver on those targets. The fourth pillar is on cybersecurity. It's actually a cross-cutting area. Um, and we are mainstreaming this, this, this um, uh, area in all of the uh, programs that we have. Um, this is the policy dimension. And we have also an investment uh, dimension, uh, which is supported by the economic and investment plan for the Eastern Partnership. For us, it's really the key tool to put the digital transformation into motion. So we need to agree on common standards to align with the EU regulatory frameworks. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we can uh, mobilize public and private financing um, to deliver on concrete achievements. And this economic and investment plan has uh, the target to mobilize uh, at least 1.5 billion euro in public and private investments in the field of the digital transformation. Um, and we are working with uh, European and international financial institutions, so the EIB, EBRD, the World Bank, and the others. 
And we are also working with member states in a Team Europe approach. The idea is to pool the resources and the expertise of the member states to make sure that we can all together deliver on those investment priorities. Um, actually, we have identified with each of the countries so-called flagships initiatives, which are country-specific investment priorities, and a number of them are in the field of the digital transformation and digital connectivity. Um, and going forward, this is really the top priority of the Commission to deliver on those investment priorities to produce tangible benefits uh, for citizens on the ground. Last but not least, uh, our economic investment plan is linked to a wider policy strategy in the Commission, which is called the Global Gateway Strategy. Um, and this is the EU global strategy to invest in quality infrastructure, respecting the highest um, social and environmental standards. And when it comes to digital infrastructure, we pay, um, we pay attention, of course, to the cybersecurity standards. It is today we cannot consider digital connectivity and digital security as being separated. It needs to be um, aligned. So th this is the, the targets that we have, and how can we deliver on them? Well, first, EU for Digital. Um, this is our toolbox. Uh, it's, um, it is composed of all of the regional programs that we have. Um, I will not uh, list them all. I just want to, to say that we have been working with the partners in all of the areas of the digital transformation since 2016, and the EU for Digital initiative is is constantly growing. Um, we have two new programs uh, in the pipeline. The first one is to develop broadband project preparation facility. Um, we are in the process of uh, negotiating the contract with the, the World Bank and uh, the aim would be to support the partner countries investing in um, safe, affordable digital connectivity in rural areas focusing on the last mile segment when uh, there is not such a business case for the private sector to invest uh, fully in it. The second program we are uh, developing is to develop, uh, and it's extremely relevant for today's discussion, to develop the startup ecosystem in the Eastern Partnership. Um, we've been assessing the maturity of the ecosystem in the last years and we have identified a number of gaps and one of the most important is uh, on the incubation, um, at the incubation stage that there is a need to empower the incubators with more resources, with the capacity to launch targeted calls for proposals, to um, also network with the European and international um, ecosystem. And this is why in the next months we plan to launch a 20 million euro regional program focusing on uh, support to startup ecosystem and really on this incubation um, phase to make sure that uh, the, the, the ratio, the success rate of the startups grows and that we can have a bankable pipeline of startups in the region in the next years. Um, on the investment side, I already mentioned this economic investment plan and I think it's important here to really understand what this is. Um, under this economic investment plan, we are grouping um, innovative financial mo modalities. So, as you know, the Commission can provide grants, but we can also blend grants with loans provided by the uh, European and international financial institutions. And we can also guarantee uh, the investments by our partners, especially the loans. Um, and this is a way to de-risk the investment to make sure that we can invest in those sectors where there is there are too much risk, and sometimes our partners are not willing to take this risk. So um, it is a very um, important tool today for the Commission, this economic investment plan, and we are constantly discussing with the IFIs and the private sector in the region to see what is the best pipeline of project we can support. And in the field of digital, I think it's important that um, there is a single pipeline uh, that the government and the partners can all agree on very specific priorities that they can propose to the Commission and with the guarantees that we, the guarantee, the financial, the budgetary guarantee that we provide, we can make sure that those projects uh, materialize. Um, I will just give you a few examples of those uh, flagship uh, of the economic investment plan. 
Um, most of them at the moment are in the field of digital connectivity. So um, in Georgia, we have a very successful example to develop uh, broadband in rural areas uh, under, the, under the responsibility of the OpenNet state agency. And we are working with the World Bank and the uh, uh, European Investment Bank to make sure that um, rural settlements can be connected. And in Azerbaijan, we uh, are also supporting the rollout of broadband in uh, rural areas with AS Telecom and EBRD. And this is actually, this was the first transaction that we signed under this uh, economic investment plan in the field of digital in Azerbaijan. So we were very happy for this. Uh, for this. I'd like to conclude because I see the time is running out. Um, and that's really just to, 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 to summarize um, that the Commission is, uh, of course, stepping up. Uh, um, we are stepping up our support to the digital transformation. This is one of the five long term priorities that we have with the region, not to mention that this is extremely high on the EU agenda. Um, and in doing so, we are using uh, a policy first approach. Uh, it's important that we um, align with the EU uh, standards in the field. This is not only relevant for the countries which have embarked on the EU European path, but also for all of our partners to develop a competitive advantage. Uh, this is a fast evolving uh, sector, and uh, it's important that we can speak the same language if we invest in, uh, in, cross, in uh, transnational projects. Um, and to support our priorities, we have this economic investment plan, so the role of the private sector is key, and also uh, the role of the European and international financial institutions, which I hope we can see in the room, maybe in the next summit. Uh, um, voilà. So I would like to thank again the organizers. Uh, it was a very nice event, we really enjoyed it, and uh, I think it signals from the Moldovan side that there is uh, such a high momentum to invest further in the digital transformation and we will support you and support the implementation of the new strategy, which is a very good uh, document. Thank you. Thank you. And just to mention that the implementing partner in both in Azerbaijan and the Georgia are strategists. So actually we're implementing with the BRD, but uh, thank you for your take. And I think that the only component that we missed here today in this, for, uh, and thank you for your perspective on each one of the countries, but we have today the round table to discuss actually the component that we lack is a synergy. The Eastern Partnership is a joint initiative. It's not country by country. And that's something that we'll take for the next discussion. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Anatoly, and thank you all um, participants from uh, the European Commission and the AP uh, countries. Um, it's been a lot of efforts put together uh, since 2015 to bring the priorities that Thibault mentioned, specifically on the startup ecosystem building. Uh, we've had uh, this component uh, uh, raised multiple times, specifically for Moldova. So thank you for reassuring that this is the, um, these are the priorities for the next period of time. We will move forward with our agenda to the next session, uh, specifically uh, on uh, fostering future proof of digital skills. It will be chaired by Ms. Doina Nistor, uh, Chief of Party uh, of the Future Technology Activity. And uh, we'll have in the panel uh, some high-level guests Stefan Baciu, who is the Regional Director of South Southeastern Europe, Romania and Moldova. Yanis Grevins, Director of the RTU Riga Business School. Rick Rasmussen, University of California, Berkeley. And uh, last but not least, uh, the pleasure to have on, on the stage, Varel Bostan, a Rector of the Technical University of Moldova. Uh, until we have the small setup, uh, we have time to, to get on stage. Thank you.
English, yes, please. The future of jobs is international, so we will have this panel in English. Uh, welcome everyone uh, this morning for the second day of Moldova Digital Summit. The IT industry, congratulations, that has really raised the bar uh, for the industry and for the summit. And we're so glad to welcome so many exciting guests uh, who crossed the ocean to see us. Next five years uh, is done by World Economic Forum. As, as you see there, the big data analytics, uh, for example, uh, are the one, uh, is the one technology that's gonna impact the jobs. And if we can go to the second slide, And if we can go to the second slide, we can see that the fear that we have that automation and technology will cut jobs, that we will lose jobs, is actually incorrect because there will be many new jobs that will be created as a result of technology. What we see here is that when it comes to the deep technology or to the specific areas of technology, there is 1.5 million new jobs that will be created and 35% increase will be in the top five areas that I have pulled out here, which is AI, machine learning, sustainability specialists, business intelligence analysts, information security experts, fintech engineers, data analytics, robotics, and then big data specialists. So you see here that uh, there are all of these new jobs and new roles created. At the same time, uh, we have uh, big layoffs in California and Silicon Valley, and I want to uh, take a chance to um, discuss about this uh, with Rick. Rick Rasmussen, who's joining us from UC Berkeley, Sutarcha Center for Engineering and Technology. Uh, he comes from the Valley. Rick, we want to know uh, what's happening in the Valley? Uh, what's the cause of these layoffs? Is this continuing? Should we be afraid that there will be some layoffs in Moldova? Because our IT companies are actually looking uh, to hire new people. Uh, what's, what's the feeling? What's the perspective from the Valley? There we go. Well, if you read the news, and, and all the reports and everything else, the media is focused on how terrible things are. And, you know, California, Silicon Valley has is, is lost all of its influence, and people are being laid off left and right, and Facebook and Google and other companies are no longer going to have market dominance and, and everything else like that. And, and that's, that's a function somewhat of the media. All the numbers are true, but there's been an intense focus on that to the point where San Francisco has been labeled uh, as having a doom loop. I don't know if you've seen that. But the news has been so bad, and it's getting worse, and the news reinforces itself. And so the, the San Francisco will never dig itself out of this hole that's being created. Um, and I, we had a talk last night on this stage, and uh, basically talked about the fact that this is, this is a regular cycle, that about every eight years, we see a downturn. And that's only because there's been such strong success. The layoffs that happened just recently at, at Facebook and Google and others represent 5% of re really what was considered to be an overinflated workforce. And so for the most part, the layoffs that are happening now are, have been, are a correction, an overdue correction. And so uh, it's, it's temporary and for the most part those, those have stopped. And companies are refocusing on not necessarily the technologies that have been developed over the last five years, but looking forward into things like you were talking about here. So all the new jobs that are happening are being hired for, people are being reallocated, and there's a transition that's happening as we come out of COVID. The workforces are changing, the needs of the companies are changing. So I would regard the news as being very temporary and that I'm looking forward to the next new cycle. So we shouldn't be afraid. And you mentioned 5%, and maybe in absolute figures, 250,000, that's a lot. But when it comes to 5%, so that probably is not, is not like something that Moldova should be worried about, because Moldova is far away. So uh, just to conclude, in order we need to invest in the new skill set and the new jobs. We talked a little bit <clears throat> about the opportunity that it creates for startups. You come from 
uh, UC Berkeley, that's one of the top, number one, number two, you tell us, uh, universities in the world to create startups. Um, we, you know, you're the oldest accelerator uh, on the campus. What's happening in the student startup world? And we are starting a boot camp for Moldovan uh, students, uh, startup uh, semester next week. Uh, so tell us a bit about that opportunity for students when it comes to the, to the young professionals. Um, well, just to comment on, on the statistic. So Berkeley and Stanford have a strong rivalry historically, both in academically as well as on the football field. And so we argue who is going, who's producing the most startups. And Stanford has a slight lead statistically, but for now. We'll is this see. Tony, is this our, in, in the group to argue now? Because they said that they are the land of unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, everybody needs a brand. And so you, you take that brand and you hold it up and you're, you're proud of, of, uh, of what you have. So in, in terms of the, I'm sorry, the question was all about the yes. Berkeley, the boot camp next, yes. that's happening next Acceleration. week? Acceleration. Great. So real, I'm, I'm super proud to be here along with uh, my colleagues that are coming in and two students as well from Berkeley. We, one of the ways in which we teach entrepreneurship is through the entrepreneurial journey. So uh, whether it's a semester long course or something like we're doing next week, which is a week long program, we take students, we have them come up with some sort of an idea, a problem to be solved, an unmet need. We teach them the methodology by which to take that hypothesis and validate it. So we're gonna run through this validation process of problem, solution, go to market, and our, our students are actually going to pre present in front of a panelist of in investors and experts at the end of the week. So it's 70 students from both uh, the state university as well as technical university. So 70 students, teams of five we form, and they have never worked together before. So we're going to form brand, 14 brand new companies from scratch over the course of a week and have those judged. So it's all pretty exciting, and by the way, for those of you, we're happy to provide the program, and anybody's invited to come in and observe mm -hmm. at any point in time. So you're looking at students as the new source of startups. Oh. Um, so first off, entrepreneurship is a skill set that should be learned, I think, in almost any top university around the world. Um, it is the idea of taking an idea and moving it closer towards market needs overall, and then teaching the capability of exactly how to do that. So the students that take our programs, some of them do form startups. It's a minority because in many cases, these are teams that have never worked together, and they may or may not gel together. In some cases, they do. Most of my classes, of which we have maybe 20 to, to 30 individual teams going, we might get one or two startups coming out of that. So it's not a goal, but the skill set applies for if and when they want to do a startup in the future, or they join a corporation, and those skill sets apply when you become part of a larger team, and you have to think entrepreneurially in order to get your, your project out there into the marketplace. So this is great. I mean, it's great hope for Moldova, and I was talking to uh, many of the larger banks in Moldova, and they say that they're fewer startups and fewer SMEs in Moldova than, for example, in nearby Romania. And we'll hear the Romanian perspective in a second. But not before, uh, I want to ask you the two last questions. One is, when you look at the core curriculum at UC Berkeley and at Sutarcha Center, what are some of the newer areas that you're focusing on in terms of core curriculum? So, the... Uh, through the AI perspective and what's happening around the world. So there's generic entrepreneurship courses where we open it up and we say, come up with an idea or problem to be solved. But there are many others that we call challenge labs where we take a theme. So we, take, we, we have the journey, but then we bring in an industry expert as well to teach that capability, and then we form companies around that theme. So I've taught cybersecurity, we have, we have had anti-terrorism, we have plant-based meat, we have a number of different themes. And, and so this year, of course, AI is the, is the overall theme, and so we'll have a number of AI-based classes. Plant-based meat, that's uh, something for Moldova to think about. There are a lot of plants in Moldova, a lot of agriculture in general. Moldova, the zootechnical uh, area, has, uh, is lagging behind, so that's an innovation that we can think about. And last question, but not least, is um, in terms of AI and education, and when we talked about AI, do you allow it in classroom? 
Oh, the, the question is, uh, can AI be used for cheating? You know, if you're assigned a paper or given, an, a, given a project to do, is AI allowed or prohibited? And it's like asking, should you use the internet for, you know, the, the generation of knowledge? The answer, it, for me at least, I think every professor is going to have their own individual opinion. For me, at least, I teach entrepreneurship. Of course you should use AI to go off and come up with some ideas and validate things. It's a tool. Don't ignore its presence. Learn to use it. Embrace it. And, and I think uh, this, the quality of the overall results that our students will see will increase as a result of their capability mm. and knowledge. So I think we, we should ask you to pitch to some universities in Europe because I hear that they <laughs> some are actually forbidding the use of AI. I guess Europe is more conservative and when we look, we look to the Valley as a source of innovation and disruption. So it's, it's great to hear that perspective that AI is actually an, a, a helper, a co-pilot for, for students and for professors. Well said, a co-pilot, I like that. Yeah, uh, switching, uh, I would like to introduce also our next speaker, Stefan Baciu, comes from, um, from Romania, in this case, from SAS. And you've seen on my earlier Future of Jobs that we talk a lot about data science. Uh, of course, um, it's not a single journey, it's not a one-man journey for a university. And we need to work with big corporations. I mean, you guys have the technology, you have the knowledge, you've built your own universities. How are you partnering? Uh, how are you partnering with education? How are you partnering with universities in Romania? Uh, tell us a bit about the, the, those use cases that you have in Romania, Stefan. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the question. We're um, investing a lot in education because uh, uh, this is the future. Yeah? Uh, any technology is useless without uh, the right uh, people using it. And uh, these skills in uh, data science, artificial intelligence are um, future proof. So basically, uh, whoever goes into this direction, we always have um, uh, a role in the, the job market. Uh, in uh, Romania, and also we have uh, discussions here with the uh, uh, Technical University of Moldova, with ASEM. Uh, in, in Romania, we're working with uh, many universities that, um, uh, where we have um, masters in data science. Uh, basically, we, um, uh, we have um, a strong methodology behind to teach. We have the, the technology itself, of course. And uh, what we also do uh, interesting is um, getting on board uh, private companies uh, such as banks. Yeah, we have a, a recent example from the University of Babes Boya in Cluj, where we partner with the Banca Transylvania. So basically, the bank comes into this program with some real uh, life use cases. And the students not only get the, let's say, theoretical knowledge, uh, the exploration uh, uh, of tools uh, themselves, the methodology, but also they get an um, uh, insight, a glimpse on real life um, use cases, real life scenarios. So they, they are putting uh, these um, um, trainings for test in uh, uh, real life scenarios. And how, how many universities uh, have you built this partnership with in Romania? Um, in terms of, uh, I think we have more than around 20 faculties. In terms of universities, I think we have around uh, 10 to 15. Yes, all over, uh, all over the So basically the all of the major universities yes, of Romania. Yes, so not, not only in Bucharest, but in uh, Iași, in uh, Constanța, in Cluj, in Brasov, in Sibiu, yeah, we And do. Uh, Stefan, can you tell us a bit, what are the job roles that you're looking to co-create together with the universities? What are the newer job roles or what, what's missing in terms of your presence as SAS uh, in Romania? Right, we, um, we take the students through this um, journey of uh, enablement or um, skilling in the um, uh, data science and data engineering. We, we, we're starting from the, the level of um, data literacy, yeah? how you manage the data, how you um, make sure the data is of good quality, how you govern the data. Then we're getting into the next step, which is data analysis. We teach a little bit more advanced uh, things. Then the third one, uh, data science. 
and uh, the fourth is data engineering. So basically in terms of um, uh, job roles, uh, people taking this kind of uh, classes, they can cover um, any kind of uh, job role both in uh, uh, existing companies or in companies of their own where they want to develop new, uh, new tools, new products, uh, new services. Yeah. Are you hiring these graduates? What's your motivation uh, to, to work with the universities? So first and foremost, uh, we're making this investment because as I said, no technology in the world can work in, in isolation uh, by itself uh, without the, the right people. Yeah, so we see, um, uh, a, let's say, a gap in terms of uh, skilled resources in this domain, which is data science and AI. So this is a kind of a future-proof investment for us, so we assure that we secure a place on the, on the market. Um, we do hire people, uh, uh, students from uh, uh, these uh, universities. Basically, we have internship programs, and after an internship program, um, a student, an intern, either is going to be hired by us or by one of our partners, and also, our customers are coming towards us uh, with the request to send them uh, CVs uh, of uh, trained, skilled uh, students that uh, went through these uh, classes. And we discussed, I want to just highlight that we discussed a similar cooperation for Moldova because you see that in Moldova, uh, your market could be growing. Uh, you have uh, clients, you know, the big, the banks are your very important clients that need to uh, undergo their own journey of digital transformation and we want to we want to do more seamless uh, online banking and you need data scientists and I was talking to some of your colleagues uh, a couple of weeks ago that the estimation is that in Moldova there are at least 400 uh, lacking data scientists or data engineers that uh, you could hire and many of your colleagues could hire but they're simply not being produced uh, by the universities at this point. I would say 400 as of yesterday, but uh, moving forward, we're going to need uh, much, much more because the, uh, the demand is here in terms of all the companies looking to put this kind of uh, technology to, to good work. And uh, uh, the, the growth and the attention that we see now um, for, for Moldova, it's, it's only uh, going to be higher. So uh, in, in the next years to come, I think uh, we'll, the, the, the gap will be higher if we don't uh, uh, cover it. And um, uh, we, we need, uh, really need a pool of uh, skilled people in, in thousands, I would estimate. And thank you for this uh, last remark and just to highlight that Moldova's journey for the tech industry is towards higher value added and what uh, we're aiming uh, to send the message that we need to reskill and upskill uh, even the existing uh, work tech workforce of Moldova so that we uh, curate their career path towards more high value added and data science would be one of the areas that would be very in high demand as well as cybersecurity and some of the other areas that we've seen. So it doesn't mean that we need to work only with students, but we also need to introduce this master's uh, degree, mini master's, that we continuously educate the existing uh, data pool so that Moldova remains competitive and goes into the high value added. And I want to, to switch to Yanis here, Yanis Grevis, who comes from uh, Riga. And we were in Riga, Yanis, uh, when was it? A couple of months ago. We were truly impressed But what you are doing uh, in Latvia. Uh, I just want to highlight, I'm not sure that you'll talk about it, but we were impressed about how you uh, implement the Harvard CIS uh, computer science fundamentals uh, in K-12 in the schools uh, as an equivalent of uh, the informatics exam and uh, what you do at the university level, uh, how you take technology not only as a vertical to produce engineers and coders, but also horizontally because um, technology is losing boundaries. Uh, can you talk a bit how's, how's the uh, outlook in, in Latvia and what you do at Riga Business School? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I think when, when I hear these numbers, we need 3,000 more of these graduates and 4,000 more of these graduates. We went, uh, Latvian government charged us to do this exercise 
uh, about seven, five, seven years ago, and the answer was mission impossible. We went on a tour through US and UK, and what we really found out, technically, no more people want to study data science than they study right now. No more people want to study coding than they study right now. So that's a dead end. And then with the Latvian government, we said, okay, how do we make it differently? And what we found out is really it boils down to training a little bit of digital subjects to everybody around, around the society. So the fact that you can have a linguist without computer skills, or oh, in Latvia, it's still there, but it, for, in my world, it's a joke. Because linguistics, translations, localizations, it's all about IE. And so if you can go to the next slide, that's a challenge I think I pos propose to everybody around, and that's what we came down to, is, slide, okay, but... so this is from the same source you showed, so a AI will not displace jobs, that requires these things, but you know, AI is like an organism. It makes sure that it survives itself. So it actually will not replace the people who apply AI in practice and kind of help it to grow. It's like a virus. And so in order to keep our people in the job market, drive our economies, we have to figure out how we make that virus spread through the societies. And the challenge we then made with Latvian government is what, what does it take that we will have to upgrade 50% of working population, everybody in this, in this hall, how do we upgrade that next year we are more skilled in IE in our job than we were yesterday? More skilled in data, in something else. And that's, that's I think, is we have to think about. And uh, that's where we went through these journeys that we need to, first of all, get the materials, get them in Latvian, and uh, we happen to have finding a good partner uh, in Harvard University in CS50 course, where we made the promise we'll make, use artificial intelligence to localize all the materials, academic materials. We had a big discussion, will it have the right vocabulary? And our answer was, it will not simply because for academic material where new words were invented in Boston, in San Francisco last week, there is no Latvian equivalent, but we will translate the rest and the Latvian equivalent will come. And we, that's our promise, and that's what we do. Yanis, by the way, uh, do I recall correctly that informatics is mandatory in uh, Latvia? No, that would be the hope, but we are that now be working it, it, it throughout the system, but really making it mandatory will not help you because you don't have the faculty members who can teach it mandatory, and that's where we went on the journey for universities. We trained 70 faculty members in U.S. to teach digital, and to teach digital not only in computer science department, but in linguistics, in arts, in economics, social sciences, engineering, everywhere else. In technical university, we are introducing CS50 as a cross the board course for uh, students who are not in uh, computer science. In uh, high schools, we are introducing that as an advanced, as a computer science course in high schools. Why are you taking American universities and not European universities? Oh, no, you are asking a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, very simple. Um, uh, CS50 is the largest computer science course in the world. At any given point in time, 50, like 20, 30,000 students take it. And it has been designed for high schools as well. So we take the high school version more practical uh, if, uh, and I will get into the technicalities. CS50 is not a programming course, although it teaches five programming languages. It's a course which teaches students how, what they can get out of the computers for whatever they want to do. And that's a very important skill we believe to understand. It's like going into a shop and taking what tools you have. They have to learn what tools to it's use for what? It's a digital analytics. It's basically understanding it's, it's what to do with technology. Planning. If we can mining. jump to the last slide in my presentation, that will give you an answer. 
skips the rest, goes the last. And I think yeah, that those who want slide, to see the slides in the middle, they just, this, they will have. Wow, you prepared okay. a lot of slides. Okay, this is an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Coding isn't a necessary leadership skill, but digital literacy is. Yes. Yes, so I think we're in full agreement. Moldova, Latvia, the US, and everyone else. Yeah, so I think that's what our philosophy is. Everybody have to be digitally literate. And by that, what I think in cost-efficient, we, we have to see, and that's what the presentation in the middle is, how for your skills, for your skills, for the skills of a small, medium enterprises, for the people who work in wineries. I heard the great thing, the Technical University opens a wine lab to help the wineries, but in general, how do you introduce digital tools into wineries? For I agree, and I agree with that because we ran an IT fundamentals course together with a private partner, uh, and we had 600 applications in one week mm -hmm. and we could teach 80 students and I went there and it's a, it's continuous education I went there to talk to students and I asked them like what do they do three we have pharmaceutics medical mm -hmm. tourism marketing banking finance so a lot of and I asked them like why do you do uh, why did you apply for this course and they told me technology is everywhere and they were people in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, so there was like no age limit. Uh, so I think we're at that point in time when everybody realizes that technology transcends the IT industry. Technology is everywhere, and it's that point when everybody needs to learn. In school, in university, in businesses, even we need to learn. Yep, and, and I think for adding to that, for a small medium enterprises which is still this technology i don't know whether you know that this technology exists it's one of the fastest actually how you can get small companies to digitalize because creating an app which recognizes diseases in uh, uh, what in the grape grape plants doing all of these things that can be done probably in a couple of weeks on this tool and equipping even the people who are not using technology with tools where, say, everyday work will be improved, that is key where the digital literacy comes in. So I agree, uh, and I conclude that I had the, uh, the chance to uh, visit the Brussels office of Digital Europe a couple of months ago, and when I asked about the priorities for education and for skills, they told me that reskilling and upskilling is number one priority, and then the second one is cybersecurity. And with that, I'd like to switch to the director of the Technical University, Virel Bostan, uh, to ask you not about the university, but about the upcoming uh, cybersecurity uh, center and why do you feel that this is an area that the Technical University needs to invest in and to prepare a future workforce? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we already benefited a lot from uh, different uh, projects uh, in which the industry and uh, our partners are helping us to modernize the curricula because uh, the universities are quite conservative most of the time and, and uh, not that flexible, rigid. Of course, uh, 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 every time people are bringing arguments like uh, we have to ensure quality, but uh, uh, what is happening is that uh, we are becoming too traditional, it's uh, very hard to change. And therefore, we should embrace uh, the industry help and partnerships because we will bring the change, will force us to change. Second thing is that uh, also uh, the education system in, in general is very inertial. Uh, the changes uh, that we will uh, make will have effect in five, ten years in one or two accreditation cycles. Uh, you will prepare, uh, you will change the curricula and the effects will be felt in 10 years when uh, the graduate will uh, become a professional. So uh, uh, starting from these axioms, uh, we uh, decided to be more flexible in order to change the curricula and uh, sought the uh, industry partners. And TechWheel is one example and other uh, similar centers that we are running together with industry. Therefore, when uh, 
Uh, we have uh, the discussion in our university together with my vice rector for digitalization, Dino is here. We, we were asking ourselves what will be the next big provocation for the country. And uh, clearly the cybersecurity was a very big uh, uh, issue for our country, not only. Uh, actually, we uh, were dealing with some attacks or, or uh, uh, the lack of, of uh, cyber hygiene, for example. And then, uh, so uh, this cybersecurity center was a very natural, intuitive thing. And then, when uh, uh, we started to think about what should be the activities, functionalities of this center, and uh, we decided to focus not only on the uh, poor academic tasks, but also on uh, uh, how to bring more stockholders to this center in order to ensure sustainability and, and its uh, importance. Right, and we have uh, the big global players, big global technology partners that you have signed an agreement with. Palo Alto, uh, Fortnite, and then uh, we Cisco have Cisco, and all, uh, they're all there uh, with the cybersecurity center, which means that from the start, you're industry driven, you have the latest top-notch technology, and you're able to not only train students, but also train professionals, uh, fuel, you know, the government with, with the needed uh, certified, hopefully, cybersecurity engineers. Exactly, because if you ask a professor to develop a course, uh, he will develop a course based on his knowledge. Uh, exactly what he knows, not what is needed. Uh, therefore, uh, when we were updating our ICT curricula, for example, four or five years ago, we decided to go uh, by using certified courses, not to reinvent the wheel. If there are already courses available, why not uh, we should use them? The same as, uh, for example, Latvia decided to use CS50 as a uh, core uh, course. So yeah, uh, we have this experience with Cisco, with our partners, therefore in Cybersecurity Academy, clearly we will be using the content provided by big uh, software companies. In this so field. when does it open, uh, Mr. Rector? Uh, right now we are at the construction phase. Uh, so we are hoping to finalize all the necessary infrastructure by December. Uh, but we are already working on the content, on the uh, functionalities, uh, who will be involved, at what level, what will be the structure, uh, because we don't want just open a facility and then uh, to spend one or two years to, to, to fill it with... Uh, and, and you have a big partnership with the government, so with the eGov Center and with the cybersecurity, with the National Cybersecurity uh, and IT Center with STISC, so... It's a joint effort. Exactly. Can you also speak about that, uh, this partnership and what's the value that it brings? The value is, first of all, uh, we will be always provided with the content, with activities. Uh, I don't want to have uh, a center in which uh, uh, only academic activities will happen. Uh, you mean real again, data and real... Exactly. You need real data, you need real problems. And again, uh, uh, of course, one mission for the university is to transfer knowledge and then to generate knowledge. But the third mission is how to be involved in society needs, in country needs. And without uh, uh, government and uh, related uh, uh, structures, uh, you cannot uh, ensure that you will be solving real problems, not just poor theoretical things. And I want to. I want to. So we we'll, we we'll look forward to having the academy functional by the end of this year, and uh, also we want to cooperate with Romania, of course. Uh, that holds the cybersecurity flag for excellence, uh, not only for Romania but for Europe. Uh, and it's very close, so we are fortunate, lucky we're in the same uh, digital space, cultural and educational space. But um, switching uh, the topic here for a moment, uh, a year ago we signed a big partnership agreement, the only one, I think the, the first one for Moldova uh, with uh, UC Berkeley, with the University of Such Caliber. Uh, it, the partnership agreement was signed by the Technical University and the State University with Sutarcha Center for Engineering and Technology, that's why Rick is here, uh, with, the, with the idea to implement, the sta to implement startup semester in Moldova to learn from uh, the startup entrepreneurial mindset, uh, speaking about number one and number two, whether UC Berkeley is number one or number two in the world, they uh, challenge what is the technical university, is it number one or number two in Moldova? <laughs> 
Uh, can you speak about a little bit about that, like how important is educating entrepreneurs uh, for the technical university? Are you looking forward to the, uh, doing the boot camp next week with UC Berkeley, with UC Berkeley professors? How did you feel going to UC Berkeley and immersing yourself into the startup education uh, piece and how important this is for your students? Also, uh, first of all, uh we, we tried to introduce entrepreneurship in our university programs back five years ago. And, and uh, I recall uh, a lot of discussions with our colleagues from uh, economics uh, department. And what happened uh, was that we took just the classical course on microeconomics on small businesses, uh, you know, and changed the name. And then uh, we said, no, no, this is not entrepreneurship. And, and uh, uh, actually, I was very glad to, to visit Berkeley on the second occasion and uh, to understand what is uh, actually the startup philosophy and how a real entrepreneurship education should be. Uh, we have uh, a lot of opportunities at our university since we are a very multidisciplinary university. Uh, we don't have just the poor engineering uh, uh, programs, but we have also programs from arts, uh, from architecture, from design. We have uh, economics program, a small law program, and uh, since last summer we have also agriculture and uh, veterinary medicine program. Uh, so we are quite a comprehensive university, and entrepreneurship doesn't mean just uh, we start a thing in ICT. Entrepreneurship is uh, much uh, wider and uh, as I am saying to the ICT students, uh, ICT should be your secret tool and you should, uh, you should learn other uh, fields in order to apply this, uh, this uh, technology, this knowledge. And in the same manner we are saying to the students from other programs, non-ICT, that ICT is a very nice tool to know in order to solve problems. So this entrepreneurship bootcamp, I'm looking forward, it will be a great opportunity for us to change the uh, minds of our professors and I'm uh, uh, actually uh, asking the professors uh, to, to be involved in this bootcamp to learn from the best in the world how to run entrepreneurship courses, how to build entrepreneurship skills and then, uh, uh, then uh, we will uh, change the whole curricular approach uh, how to teach this and our plan is to enforce uh, a university-wide one or two entrepreneurship-related uh, courses like uh, introduction or entrepreneurship and then uh, product uh, development, for example. In the same manner as we did with ICT courses, all our students in technical university are having two classes. One in the first semester based on Cisco curricula, introduction to ICT, and the other one is introduction to Python. Uh, we choose Python because it's a very simple algorithmic structure and still it is a high level uh, programming language. And even the students from architecture or from law program are doing a class in Python. And I think that is uh, a good investment in the future digital skills of uh, our graduates. Uh, I mean, I totally agree and um, I had an opportunity since you mentioned AgTech and uh, the fields of medical industry. I had an opportunity to talk to a young neurosurgeon, Moldovan guy who is, uh, likes to play games. And because he likes to play games, he didn't study technology in his medical school, but then he connected the two and he's using the VR headset to rehearse on the surgery. So if he receives the results of the surgery, he says, I don't wanna open the patient and think what I wanna do. I like rehearse different scenarios of how I'm gonna perform the surgery and I'm more prepared when I'm actually in the surgery. And this is a young neurosurgeon from Moldova, and he was convincing us that we need to launch a health tech uh, space to help uh, propel technology into the medical field. And the same with agriculture, and together we are doing an ag agri-IT arena where we're bringing technology uh, to agriculture. So now it's, it's so diffuse uh, and it's everywhere. And uh, you're absolutely right that introducing, as Yanis was saying earlier, technology horizontally, not going, going deep, deep vertically, but also realizing that it has to be more present in every area of study, of education. This is critical and it's that moment where we need not only to talk about it, and I'm glad that the university is already uh, doing it. I would like to take maybe a few questions, uh, if there are any opinions or questions uh, to our esteemed guests from the audience. If I see any hands, I can take a few questions. Yes, um, with the microphone. Marina. Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm Professor Sparks. So I just started an incubator here because my wife is Moldovan, so I wanted to start up. So it's actually with Rick and Foriel. Since I'm a cybersecurity expert, I built the first CERT for the US military. I taught NATO risk management. I just finished uh, five years running the cybersecurity with HSBC, and we built an innovative lab that is now used by all the certification bodies. So when we combine uh, an ecosystem, an incubation system with cybersecurity, and we see this trend of tech is a coming up everywhere. FinTech comes into technology going into a career is going to be fundamental. The same thing that we're talking about digital literacy among everything. Unfortunately, being a professor, the curriculum was always way out of date. So I was running the capstone course for University of um, Maryland and I left because it wasn't doing it. I could not take my students and bring them into work at HSBC. I couldn't recommend them to do a job. So how can we do it differently here in um, Moldova to build an actual cybersecurity center of excellence that actually gets into the FinTech, the health tech, and everything as action learning programs? I, I think that the, the, the answer is uh, uh, just uh, to, to make sure that the uh, center will be flexible to meet all the needs of the industry. Uh, we are already trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, change the, the obstacles created by the government uh, legislation in the education field. And, uh, for example, finally, I hope uh, quite fast the micro-credentials and certifications, uh, micro-certifications will be introduced in, in our uh, uh, regulations. And then uh, this will open uh, uh, completely new opportunities for the universities to be involved in, uh, in, uh, in establishing better contacts with, uh, with uh, uh, companies and, and uh, general ecosystem. And uh, I want to add to that that what uh, Virel is saying, uh, just to say that we have two uh, important modifications to the amendments to the education code in Moldova. One is to introduce micro credentials and open the door for uh, bytes or sound bytes learning, and we hope that this will allow to do so called mini masters or micro masters as a new education de um, product of Moldovan universities, and the second is to also allow industry fellows to teach, which means if we can take students into the private sector, take private sector to students. And I also want to give uh, Rick an opportunity to answer that question, like how are you guys resolving it at uh, UC Berkeley? No, I, th I think the idea of a vertical incubator, vertical accelerator, is super interesting, especially in a specialized subject like cybersecurity. And so you become a point of light that gathers in other experts from the field, potentially from industry, that can help with not only development of ideas and concepts, but also the mentorship that's required to go ahead and connect those ideas to industry overall. And so I think it's a strong answer potentially to this obsolete, and I don't say it here, I think the, the curriculum would be very current, of course, and then some, yeah. Um, so, so here you have the opportunity to create that from scratch. Yeah. Yes, and so congratulations on that. We're super excited to learn more. And I would also, I see Yanis wants to also answer. I, I, I think it's, you raised a very fundamental question. And I think what we have is, with the digitalization, is very, very fundamental change in what the role of the faculty member is. And as the rector very r nicely said, the historic perspective that the faculty member creates knowledge and presents knowledge, in our mind, in my mind, that's history. Uh, what we are very, very much looking at, the question was why we chose Harvard. Very simple, because Harvard re uh, reworks all their materials every semester. So every semester material set is new. And what we do in Latvia, we have the mentors, we have the high school teachers who are trained to use every semester new materials. And I think that is it's a fundamental shift, how we, how we think about getting it up to speed so that we get the understanding that we are sourcing materials globally, 
from the providers, and that includes all the MOOC courses, Coursera, edX, Udacity, whatever the course is, and we have the local mentors. Because the flip side is also true. The perception that, oh, we have a Udacity course or Coursera course out there, that 3% completion rate, totally useless. We need local mentors who constantly look for these new materials and they're available for very small monies to get introduced. So that's I mean, our I agree, Yanis. I mean, it's hard for me to complete a Coursera course. I need a face-to-face -face or someone yep. to tell me, Duane, I need to study, need to study. Remind me, I have homework to do. It's sort of a discipline. Like, I don't go to gym, so I need someone to tell me, I need, you need to go to gym. Right. Uh, and Stefan also, I wanted to answer that because, I mean, you managed to go into the Romanian universities. I mean, cybersecurity, data science, you're not far away because they all require practical, real-life data, and it's changing, technology is changing so fast. Did you feel any pushback from the Romanian universities where they open to adopt the, so I'll, well, I'll call it vendor-based curriculum, right, or... Uh, private-based uh, curriculum, and who teaches, in your case, in the universities? Actually, no. Uh, we were all surprised that this picked up very fast, and um, uh, basically the, the, the curricula is uh, also discussed and agreed with the, with the universities. And also, they, they um, welcome uh, these um, real-life cases coming from the um, outside of the university. O what was also surprising is that um, uh, actors in the public sector uh, wanted to get involved. I, I, I had a discussion with the Competition Council of Romania together with the Polytechnic in, um, University of Bucharest, where they wanted to participate to, um, uh, to these uh, classes, giving uh, scenarios for analysis, and um, students um, working on this uh, real, real life uh, kind of uh, cases. So there, there is a tight cooperation that, that we um, try to put in place between uh, us as technology supplier, uh, universities, and uh, other companies Companies, and who, who teaches, how do you resolve the faculty member issue? Like who teaches the SAS curriculum in your case at the universities? So we, we have a mixed uh, kind of approach. We have obviously the train the trainer uh, approach. So we, we um, take the, the professors through, through all the material that it's ready made. Uh, we enable them how to, how to teach the, uh, the courses, obviously. Uh, and we also have our experts who, who from time to time uh, come to seminars, to workshops, and enable uh, furthermore the, the students. Uh, Rick, you want to add something? I just, I just wanted to comment. One of the things that, that we do at, at Berkeley is, uh, of course we have professors, those that have gone through a PhD program or on a tenure track, professionals, um, but we also have titles in I'm one called industry fellows. So I don't have a PhD, I come out of industry and if, if sort of on the leading edge, if you will, of this whole idea of entrepreneurship in general and how to teach that. And so it's a, it's a specialized center that allows uh, persons like me and others within sort of say, let's just pick cybersecurity as example from that domain, somebody would be able to be qualified to go ahead and construct a course. Their first couple of courses might be under the tutelage of a professor, but if they're qualified, can go ahead and design and lead courses. And so that, that brings in this continuous flow of people from industry. And those from industry, especially like upper level management, you know, you don't always aspire to climb the corporate ladder. At some point, you want to be able to give back. And so this gives people like myself and those others from industry the opportunity to do just that. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have that opportunity at this point in my life. And I think to the extent that universities can open up the ability for those that are not classically trained, PhD, tenure track. So uh, this is good awesome. news for me. I've been trying to get my PhD for a number of years. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to teach because <laughs> my parents were teachers. So it's good news for me. So if I want to teach, Eventually, I can be, become an industry fellow, hopefully at the Technical University of Moldova, right? Let's teach so, course together. That would be fun. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, that would be inspirational. Yeah, we can create the next um, Moldovan-American unicorns. 
That would be fun. Uh, we, we have the, um, the time for one last question from the audience. We have eight minutes left for our panel. And if I don't, uh, Victor wants to make a comment or a question. It will Just be a to question, make it short. Mm -hmm. Very short. Um, we've been listening to this excellent framework provided by Rick today and the mega trends yesterday. And the question will be the following, actually, to, to all other panelists. If you were to apply this framework, what would be three real life problems that you would focus on having in mind that at the end of, of this exercise, it, a startup has to come out of it? Essentially, I'm trying to to push you into the... So push, so they, if I can understand correctly, which would be the real life problems that startups would solve today? No, no, if, if, they, if they were those students that will be subjected to the methodology. That, okay, okay, so you're you students. And we're please, a student please, please pay attention at what our distinguished moderator said in the, in the beginning because uh, she pointed out um, the ag tech the, 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 uh, tech, te te tech, the technical yes. university just absorbed the, the, uh, the agricultural university, something which for me is a total disruption, totally unexpected, but maybe... But good, it's is, an opportunity. Exactly, but, but maybe there is a good reason for that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so top, top three, if you're aware, student had top three real life problems that you would focus on. Who wants to start? So we have one minute for each speaker if you want to elaborate. Imagine your student starting a startup, top three real life problems. Well, I don't want to, you know, give ideas to anyone, but the, of course, I would focus on the, the um, situation at hand, the, the, the issues that I con confront with the daily, whether it's um, uh, traffic jam, whether it's... Uh, traffic jam, it's good, yeah, we agree <laughs> on that. Healthcare kind of um, uh, topics, whether it's, um, I don't know, how we sell wine to America, yeah. Also very <laughs> good, so as Moldovans, as a Moldovan, I must say, I agree, traffic jam, up, good. How to send wine to America? Very good. <laughs> Yanis? Going back, uh, I think going back very simple, which seems for me is, and I don't know whether that's possible, but I hope it is, uh, can you devise a small app which actually recognizes the wine optically? Uh, there is, what? Is there, okay, so I'm That's a sorry. better app, a more user-friendly. <laughs> then my next one, and I think you pushed on a very uh, topic of mine, which is merging uh, uh, create, um, arts and technical university. I truly believe that art schools has to be in the technical university because 90% of app success is design. So, and then, therefore, my question would be, uh, again, I don't know what it is. What is the Moldovese design understanding which, where you would say this design is liked by people in Moldova and in the region so that there is a pattern, template, a palette for the regional design what the application should adopt. So those would be a couple ideas I would... Well, uh, the technical university absorbed the agricultural one, but it's not too late to ask to absorb the arts, oh, I, <laughs> the arts sorry, university. I, 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 I That's still independent, I but <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it was I a discussion. I apologize. <laughs> But you gave you gave some food for thought. <laughs> but but there, there I think is pretty natural. I have heard about all these agricultural robots, yeah. so that is. Uh, but uh, fast but I and agree. Easy. <laughs> we you, we launched uh, animation. We launched game design with the technical university, and I think we'll be continuing with the design faculty. Now there has been a consolidation of the design faculty. So I agree, design is key because you design products and services for users. So you need to have the designers, Rick. Individual problems. I don't know about that. I've that's hard for me because I, I see so many pitches all the time and pitch and pitch. And so I have a jaded attitude towards what I look at. And I sort of peel apart the methodology behind behind it. Somebody asked me the other day. I think I've seen thirty thousand pitches. Um, 
So I, I have the fortunate uh, situation of being able to step in and design a course that teaches entrepreneurial methodology. I'm super happy about that. And so I'm a, I'm a filter for ideas rather than the generator of ideas. Uh, separately, I get to teach venture capital, uh, which is the structure of venture capital. And I have a whole series of programs about being a fund manager. So for anybody that wants to start a venture capital fund, we can do that. And then the last one that I've designed for Northeastern is uh, building entrepreneurial ecosystems. And so that's why I love to come, love to come to places like this where I can observe this is a crucible, this is an experiment in progress about the development of how Moldova is moving forward and doing a really good job on implementing certain parts of how to build out a, a sufficient and successful entrepreneurial ecosystem so things develop. Rick, I thought you would say plant-based meat, but okay, oh, <laughs> we'll, settle. we'll okay. settle for a venture capital fund. We don't have a Moldova-born venture capital fund. We, we're still working on this idea, but uh, on this initiative, not idea. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's very good. We can start up a venture capital fund and um, it's a very good startup. Uh, Mr. Rector, Fidel. Yeah, I, I will uh, formulate the following problem, which is a personal problem for me right now, uh, especially in terms of uh, new capabilities of uh, AI. Uh, how to assess the students' progress toward the grade? How to measure their effort? Should we grade? Because if you will grade as we did it before, like based on homeworks, on essays, then uh, actually we will grade uh, chat GPT and not, uh, not the student. And instead we should uh, grade uh, the dynamics. I mean, uh, it's rather a philosophical maybe question, but uh, uh, we, have good, we have students with good knowledge and students with poor knowledge, but sometimes in a course the, the progress, the dynamics is from the student with bad grades or poor knowledge and then I think that student deserves a bigger grade because he he moved uh, uh, at a longer distance and then this is a, a question about how we can assess this I don't know if I start I mean my suggestion it. would be to just remove final exams there's no final exams in real life there's a life so continuous progress yeah <laughs> so maybe maybe we should uh, we should run a hackathon on educational you know uh, theme on topics. How to grade students, yes. In, no. in the era of uh, yes, AI. In the era of AI, uh, first of all, we need to reassess what those students need to know. What is a successful student uh, that will come out of university? And I think that concept is completely changing. My take is that AI is revolutionizing not only the entire world, the world of IT, the world of business, our regular life, but it's changing uh, the relevance of the universities, challenging, not changing, but challenging the relevance of the universities as is today. And I think that uh, we'll be assisting a big transformations at the university level uh, of universities, of where is their value for, the, for students, for the young people, for professionals. We see more and more partnerships. I'm glad that we have such a diverse perspective today. And I want to thank you all for joining me uh, today at Moldova Digital Summit, crossing the ocean, uh, fly, coming from Yash. Yanis uh, missed his plane, so he had to change two planes and take a car from Yash to Kishino, uh, coming from Bucharest, and the uh, rector for hosting us at the Technical University at TechWell. Uh, thank you very much to this esteemed panel. Thank you. On this wonderful note, uh, we thank our panelists and our uh, chair, and we move to the pleasant part, lunch uh, in the cafe. We have one hour. Uh, we get back at uh, uh, we get back at 1:20 uh, uh, back here. We also have three more sessions in the afternoon and some parallel sessions, so you can join any that you consider reasonable. So let's go network. Thank you.
back uh, with a new panel, uh, very interesting and uh, especially interesting since we are going to talk about policies and uh, not only, we are going to talk a lot about AI and I want to see what you guys think about this. We touched upon uh, the uh, subjects of regulating AI yesterday, but it was with the private sector, and uh, they they have a, it might have a bit different uh, opinion. And we have an amazing moderator from uh, the Swedish Embassy, Katarina Nilsson, with us. Uh, so I'll let Katarina introduce all our speakers, and this way uh, we can get a feeling of uh, what's next. Okay. So. Thank you very much, Barina. My name is Katarina Nilsson. I work for the Swedish Embassy here in Chisinau. Uh, I and my colleagues, we support a lot of digital development in Moldova and in the region. We work on this, um, this conference is with support from, uh, from Sweden and partners. We work on the future technologies activity together with USAID and uh, UKAID. Uh, we work together with the European Union on EU for Moldova startup city Kahul. And uh, we're very active in the conversations on uh, digitalization in Moldova and beyond. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today to moderate this panel on AI and public services. Uh, we have three amazing guests with us and I will let them introduce themselves. So, Saber, maybe when you want to start to introduce yourself. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Boinul Zaber. Um, I am a senior academic fellow at United Nations University, uh, e-governance operating unit. Um, so, those of you uh, probably who don't know about U UN University, it's a university. It's an initiative of United Nations and. Uh, uh, we've been there for more than 50 years now um, and uh, we have like different units around the world and we work on different type of uh, public policy related problems uh, to focus on like how to get SDGs you know um, practically implemented around the world. So um, I come from the unit uh, that actually focuses on e-governance and myself I'm a, um, I'm a tech, I mean I'm a kind of an interdisciplinary person. I have a, um, I, I work in engineering mostly and also in uh, economics um, and uh, I focus on AI. Um, uh, what we try to do in UN is, uh, UNU is that we want to first of all um, uh, make uh, publicly usable public policy tools uh, with artificial intelligence and, um, and uh, small and big data and then we actually try to also design uh, the processes so that we can actually have better communication um, so we want to be human centric and we want to build human centric AI for public services and public policy and that's basically what we do yeah thank you no yes okay hi hi everyone uh, I'm really glad to be here in Kishinev again it's always lovely to come and and uh, visit and uh, well either speak or uh, drink wine in uh, uh, the very beautiful wineries you have um, my name is Denisa I'm a senior consultant at APCO Worldwide APCO is one of the uh, largest uh, global advisory firms uh, we work with governments we also work with uh, the private sector or other um, organizations like non-governmental ones uh, to help them either improve their reputation, uh, help them engage with governments or uh, with, uh, with other international organizations and to um, yeah, communicate um, on especially around public policy. I am based in the Brussels office and uh, therefore I fo uh, focus on European Union uh, legislation and uh, especially AI and uh, Data Governance Act or Data Act. So I will focus mostly on explaining a bit the regulatory side in the EU and uh, what will, well, at some point also come to Moldova, considering that Moldova will have to approximate the legislation in the future. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Robert Bogdanfi. I'm the Public Affairs Director at ANIS, the Employers Association of the Software and Services Industry. ANIS is the counterpart of ATIC, 
who I would really like to congratulate for this fantastic event. It really sets the bar very high for us, so congratulations. Um, at, at ANIS, we, we focus on a number of policy issues. Um, we have, um, maybe some stats would be good so you understand uh, a little bit more about the organization. We have 175 members um, in the I ICT community. Um, we uh, represent around 66% of the um, sector by turnover. So um, we have both large and small companies um, we like to connect companies between themselves. We, we like very much to be active in networking, but uh, what I focus on especially, and it's one of our main issues, is policy. So uh, we focus on Romanian policy, uh, whether it's regarding cloud legislation, interoperability, AI, or um, anything else like electronic signatures. You've seen uh, pretty much um, two full days of presentations on, uh, on the issues that we're also focusing on. Um, and then we also focus on European policy. With European policy, um, I would say we are developing this uh, more and more. The attention span is a little bit difficult with the influx of legislation that we have been seeing. But um, I think it's really important that uh, national trade associations um, focus on these issues and stay ahead of the game in many ways. Thank you very much, Robert, Denise, and Saber. Uh, interesting perspectives, regulatory, policy, uh, research, and uh, applied uh, research. Uh, so when I was uh, thinking about what to discuss in this panel with these guests, after like an amazing uh, keynote speaker yesterday, very interesting panels with different perspectives. Uh, I'm, I, I want to go back to uh, why, why are we discussing uh, AI in public services here today? It's obvious that AI is everywhere, but uh, AI is a really broad concept. Uh, there is, a, as we've seen, a lot of generative uh, AI focus at the moment. There is a play, uh, a play applied AI, uh, but in public services, when I go back to my embassy and um, uh, do my uh, admin in uh, internally, I haven't seen a lot of technological uh, development in a long time, and I'm thinking in. Uh, government institutions, in uh, local authorities, there's a lot of development to be done, but there's also a lot of opportunity. So I wanted to start uh, with you, Denisa. Uh, why are we discussing AI in, in, public, uh, in public services, and, and why is this an, uh, something that needs to be on the agenda? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think I'm a tech enthusiast. I think it's uh, now the moment to start to facilitate our lives by using technology. I think this is going to be the future. It is right now already here. Uh, but I think in, uh, in the private sector, there's a lot of uptake that is very accelerated, whereas the public sector is really lagging behind. And even the most technological countries in, uh, in the world are still, I think, can do to best, best uh, than the, the laggards. Um, I think it's important to uh, start um, doing that because it, as I said, facilitates the life, but at the same time um, uh, it's important to do it cautiously. Uh, it's important to uh, have ethical and responsible AI uh, to ensure that uh, citizens are protected, to also when it comes to data and their da personal data, uh, to ensure that uh, governments are doing it in the, in the right way. And when we're talking about AI in public se sector, for instance, it's not necessarily only when it comes to our own interaction with the government. I don't know, chatbots, for instance. Uh, that could help you in the, let's say, customer service kind of um, of area. But also, uh, I'm thinking applications that will help um, have satellite image recognition to look at grasslands and identify where the lands have to be mowed, right? It's very simple uh, applications that can be used and can be uh, tried, uh, which Unfortunately, we see that they're not as promoted, maybe also because there's a lack of interaction between different governments and uh, to explain what kind of applications they use and how. Um, to come back, so 
uh, to the fact that AI should be ethical and responsible, uh, but also we need to think about how data is used. And uh, for this, I think data governance is very important. Um, we see that uh, the EU has adopted legislation in the field, so the AI Act, we've been uh, um, speaking about it, uh, that is uh, even um, now, you know, addressing different kinds of risks, what is acceptable AI to be used by public sector. An uh, area that is very important is law enforcement. In law enforcement, you can be very, very creative about how to use AI. And uh, for instance, we see that the parliament version of the, of the proposal is to ban biometric identification at distance, to ban uh, predictive policing, and this kind of things that could be used that could uh, you know, impact the um, citizens and the, the daily lives. So, uh, yeah, important to talk about AI because since November with ChatGPT, everyone is talking about that. But at the same time, um, yeah, I think we need to like think better uh, how to regulate. Uh, AI Act is one of the first uh, regulations, if not the first. And um, yeah, it's, uh, for Moldova, I would say that it's good to like keep an eye open and see what is happening and how to, to adapt to the framework that will be implemented. Thank you. That, that's really interesting to see because it was mentioned in the previous panel about the security, cybersecurity center that is being established. That it's really good that it's driven by like industry driven in terms of skills together with public institutions. Uh, so Denise, if I follow up on that, like how um, uh, how can public sector keep up with the development that is driven by industry in AI and try to both um, regulate, which is their role, but also take on board the opportunities uh, in a safe and ethical way. How, how do you see that path? The dollar question, I would say. <laughs> uh, well, investment, a lot of investment in research and innovation. This is, I think, the key. Uh, investment in companies that uh, would like also, um, uh, you know, advance that uh, yeah it's it's a difficult one um then um yeah i think it, it, we should be open right there's countries that are not uh and they don't want to i'm thinking about my sorry my home country romania uh we've been um i've been trying to in my in a previous role to deploy a um, robot to test deliveries and I've seen so much, uh, so many no's, I haven't seen in my life, I've been so rejected. Whereas in Estonia, the robots are freely to like, you know, deliver food and, uh, and um, yeah, to, to be tested. What happened is that uh, we had to move the project in Poland and Poland said yes, and now the pilot is functioning and it's, there's no risks, there haven't been any incidents. And so that's uh, how you need to be like, be open and um, yeah, to innovation. So an open mindset is key to take care of this development and utilize it in a responsible way. And Robert, uh, in your opinion, why, why is it important to discuss, discuss AI in, in public services or in public policy, which is more your, your focus area? Sure. I think when we're thinking about the, the government, um, and more than just the government, we, we can think about you know, parliament as well. Um, there's a reason why we have a separation of powers in state. So I think, I think uh, the democracy itself will be very important as a topic of discussion with AI. And that's because if I, if I think about uh, the subject, the government and as a whole, right, so all branches of government, is both a beneficiary of the systems as well as a catalyst of the systems because it contains large amounts of data, right? And it's also a regulator. So in that sense, if you're a parliamentarian, you must very much be aware of citizens' rights, uh, very much aware of the ethical standards. But if you are in law enforcement and you're searching for criminals, then you have to adapt quickly to find them, to combat them, right? You have to find tools to combat um, crooks that don't have ethical standards, right? But it has to be checked. So in that sense, it's absolutely crucial that we talk about AI and we do it now um, because these are not easy problems to solve. They will reshape the way we function in society. They will allow us to do extraordinary things in the future, but we will face extraordinary challenges as well. 
And, and the only way you can go forward with that is cooperation with the private sector because, of course, you're a catalyst with data and the best AI systems will be the ones that have the biggest sets of data and the greatest quality in the sets of data because not all data is born equal. <laughs> So, so I think that, you know, that's also, we always talk about open data, you know, well, open data is not enough uh, because if that data is not organized properly, if, you, if it does not respect certain standards, just opening that is not going to help the private sector as much as a very efficient data standardization system that then opens data and all of a sudden you will see new startups rising, you will see a lot of opportunities. So. There's so much to talk about with the public sector and, and the private sector working together to develop new ways of using AI. But from your perspective in Romania and the work you're doing there, do you think the right types of conversations are happening, uh, not only there but internationally as you see? Are we talking to the, private, to the public sector together with the private sector enough? Or are, are we talking amongst each other and not reaching those that need to hear and come on board? That's very much a leadership issue. Um, I think there are instances, for instance, in Romania, the Ministry of Innovation, Research and Digitalization has taken um, right steps in the right direction. Uh, we've seen a council for AI uh, with uh, extraordinary people, academics on it which can definitely talk about the uh, ethics and morality aspects of AI, which is very good. Um, have we seen, uh, we have seen actually in Romania one of the first the, um, governmental counselors that's an AI system, so it's very interesting. It's, it's still in the learning phase, it's very much in, at the beginning, but um, I think that uh, opened at least, it, it um, fuels the imagination to see what is possible in the future. Um, so, if you don't know about Yon, you should, uh, you should look it up. It, it was, uh, it's an interesting project and we're very much looking forward to the next iterations and the future there. Um, but we are not really at the level of cooperation that I think our members, I'm actually I'm certain that Ani's members would like to see better cooperation. And I think that also means better policy cooperation. You know, maybe do some policy sandboxes. Right? No, there's, there's a lot of talk about AI sandboxing, but what about policy sandboxing with AI, you know? Um, we would like to see some more of that. We would like to see uh, common working groups that really go into details, right? Um, it's not enough to present a general position on AI. I think you can pretty much guess what a general position on AI is for major companies or for a government. But when it gets down to the details, that really matters. And two words in the law can change the way the law is applied in, in the whole country, right? So, so we should see better ways of working together and working together faster. That's a responsibility both on our side, probably. We have to increase as well our, our proficiency in these subjects, our staffs, uh, but it's also on the government side. The government also has to have the teams uh, that are ready to do a technical discussion and perhaps sometimes leave policy issues aside. There's a time for politics and policy and there's a time for technical regulation. We're seeing this in Brussels as well. Uh, there are certain regulations in Brussels where the political aspects have seeped into technical regulations. I can tell you uh, that is a problem. We, we want to look at, uh, we want to encourage these technologies to develop safely in order to do that, we have to separate these subjects as much as possible. You can't completely separate it, that's impossible, it's utopic, right? I'm not talking about a utopia here. I'm talking about the fact that uh, the policy makers will always have a, ne a power negotiation between countries, between continents, between different interests, and that's the nature of politics. But technology does not do that, right? So if we want as a whole to have the, the future in our hands, to, or, or we have the future in our hands, but we need to keep it. Because <laughs> there's countries and there's uh, even different continents that are absolutely uh, ahead of the game sometimes, right? So if we want to keep the future in our hands, we have to be able to separate these two or at least create the right balance. 
Thank you. So, uh, Zaver, would you say that we have the future in our hands uh, as a researcher on, on machine learning and uh, AI-related topics at the UN University? Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. I don't really know. Um, well, I mean, when we see future, I mean, you know, academically speaking, we have like, you know, possible future, plausible future, and probable future. What we do is we only talk about the probable future instead of talking about the possible future. And uh, if, I, if you ask me if, um, if we have the future in our hand in terms of the possible future, I would say that yes, we do. But, um, I mean, if, if you, add, no, sorry, the probable future, then we do. But if you ask me if we have a future in our hand based on the possible possibilities that might happen, we don't have it, right? Because we don't really know what can happen. Now, when, um, coming back to AI, you know, AI is nothing but a computer program. It's just a computer program. Uh, the difference between, you know, the, the legacy programs that we actually use is that uh, we, we, we code it differently. But it also, you know, had some inputs, some outputs, you know, it does some iteration and gives you some uh, information, right? Um, what it does is it eats a lot of data. And when you eat a lot of data, you be become big and big and big. And, you know, if you have watched like uh, Japanese cartoons, then, um, you know, House Moving Castle, and you'd see like, you know, they will, there, there's this, you know, big fat um, uh, monster um, that actually get fed and fed and fed and it gets fat and, you know, before it get it bursts, it actually, um, you know, before that it was really good, but when it bursts, it's actually a disaster. So really, we don't really know what the future is when, from the prob possibilities perspective. Now, um, but AGI, the artificial general intelligence that we are talking about right now is not there. We don't have the mathematics to do that. That's plain and simple. Um, the mathematics that we actually have right now is, is, you know, is good to do some pattern matching stuff. Whatever we are seeing with, you know, this LLMs, like the large language models and etc., they're basically, um, you know, good statistical uh, mo modules with a huge number of data. Now, if you ask me, are they sentient? I would say no, but there are people who would say that maybe they are because they can craft, uh, you know, craft the languages better and everything. Um, well, that's a debate, but I mean, if we want to actually really think from a technological perspective, that artificial general intelligence might come, but not now, and it will come only when we have the mathematics. Now, just to remind you, Newton invented the law of gravity, but before that he had to have this mathematics, calculus. Until that, it couldn't be done, right? Now it's just not that, you know, apple falling down the tree and, you know, he, he could actually do that, no. Einstein had to actually wait for tensors. Mathematicians had to build tensors before he could actually have the, you know, general theory of relativity. Now, these things are not there. The mathematics of brain, how we think, how we lie, how we, I mean, joke, um, how we emotionally, you know, get imbalanced or balanced, like how we make inaccurate decisions are not there. So until that, we are not going there. So regulations that are uh, based on the fear of killer robot coming and killing us um, actually are going to hamper us. That's one, one thing I'm thinking. Um, but don't we need regulations? Yes, we do. Because why we do need that? Because most of the cases, uh, you know, the AI-related uh, research that we're actually doing, um, they get leaked out in the, in the market, and half-baked products are becoming uh, useful products. So in your application, I mean, in your social media, you have like apps like, uh, which yours uses your, your you know, face, uh, face recognition tools, etc. They can they make you look younger, older, blah blah blah. And they basically what you're doing is you're feeding those companies with some data, which you probably would not do. So I always ask people like, um, you know, uh, would you be standing somewhere in front of here and start dancing, and 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 you know, putting your makeup and doing that? People are looking at you. Ninety percent people won't do that, but 
TikTok made you do that. People do it all the time. What's the difference? How, how, why people are doing it? So these questions has to be answered. I mean, what we are trying to do is like we are trying to pull, uh, put top-down regulatory frameworks, which probably might not be contextualized from a point of view of the nation and the people. People have different, people, we need to learn from people. That's what we're, which is missing here in AI uh, related talks. So technically speaking, um, there are two dangers that I see here. One is because of uh, you know, this huge, um, I mean big technology companies based in developed countries, and it's not all the developed countries, it's only a few developed countries. They are basically now, you know, running the world, running the internet, if you like it or not. What they're doing is they're also running their regulation as well. Now, what happens is that regulations is, regulation is good, but it has to be contextualized with the country. Romania, what works for Romania might not work for Latvia, might not work for Moldova, definitely will not work for India. Um, but who, who are the people who's going to do that? Now, there are two problems with regulation I see. One is like there's this international pressure that actually makes you know, smaller countries to take hasty decisions without understanding the technology or without giving enough time, right? Um, I mean, well, I was telling you, like, you know, in, in the U.S., there are some interesting uh, things. Like, you know, for instance, when you talk about digital ID, you know, there are people in the U.S. that are div divided about that. Um, you come to Europe, it probably is not the same case, right? Um, I mean, we, we live in this same ideology of free society, the same type of, you know, uh, philosophical principles, but we see, like, the nuances in the, in the you know, regulatory field. So... Imagine like you know, other philosophies, other countries, other nations, how would they feel when it comes to them? Now, until AI has, uh, is be, being, so I mean, the, the good thing that you know, uh, you know, since ChatGPT came about, um, we have started to talk. I mean, this is something in my 16 years of living with AI, kinda, um, that, um, that we are seeing it for the first time, that people are talking. I welcome that because like, there are people who are afraid of it, there are people who are from the technology field who are also afraid of it, people who are totally not afraid of it and they basically wants, uh, wants it out of lock and key. Um, I definitely belong to the first one, right? Yeah. So yes, that's, uh, that's, that's what I think, like context is the most important thing that we need to think about. But, uh, Denisa, you are working a lot on the EU regulation and um Data Act. Do you think that that EU is having enough discussion about these things to adopt it and to context to adapt it to the context of EU? I mean, we are a group of very different countries. Is everyone on board? Is this conversation uh, being had, or is it just being regulated top down, like it's been mentioned here? I mean, when it comes to the AI Act, I think it's been like four years that they are like this negotiating. Uh, it's been like very uh, complicated because there's a lot of discussion. Uh, because of course, it's like uh, something new and we need to be cautious is the first piece of regulation that would actually, you know, um, yeah, uh, look into this. So, no, I think there's been sufficient discussion. There's been a lot of, um, of um, uh, even the legislators have listened to industry, listened to like, uh, also to civil society. So um, I, I like the EU apparatus of um, negotiation and, uh, and consultation when it comes in dialogue, when it comes to, to public policy making. Of course, no, no one will like uh, get everything they want out of it. So it is how it is. It's about compromise, right? Um, but I think it's good. And this is because um, the dialogue is ingrained in the EU policy making process. Uh, the fact that there needs to be consultation, um, you know, public consultation, stakeholder uh, conferences, events, and so on and so forth, because it's an important, um, yeah, uh, thing to, to have to ensure that everyone is happy and uh, there will not be surprises. Technical experts have to come and, like, explain to politicians what is actually going on with those AI uh, <laughs> applications and systems, you know, and not, uh, uh, yeah. Um, but if I bring in Moldova to this uh, discussion, uh, that there are 
than a lot of consultations within the EU, but Moldova and other countries who are oh, now yeah, yeah. candidates uh, or other countries that are uh, in the neighborhood uh, area, how can they um, start being part of these conversations? Because Moldova, as a candidate country, needs to adapt legislation, need to be on board on these changes, and. Uh, need to understand them and start influencing as well. Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's, um, I think some of the work is done through embassies. I wouldn't agree that this is the best way. I think it's very important to have a permanent representative in Brussels that would, of course, there's so many different topics, so many policy domains that uh, it's impossible to follow everything, but maybe look into what is very important for the members, the country, like Moldova, for instance, and, uh, like attack that piece of legislation that is important for you because you might have a competitive disadvantage or a problem like within uh, the law that uh, would uh, like later uh, create different problems. Um, so yeah, that's my be present in Brussels, go speak to the people, uh, bring them here. Well, this happened already. So during these two days, right? Uh, we've seen people from Brussels coming to, um, to discuss. Um, so yeah, dialogue and uh, yeah, it, it goes down to lobbying, right? So, And Robert, you are working in an EU country uh, with the companies uh, in, in this area. Uh, how are you and your member companies keeping up with the developments and what's your advice on this for Moldova? With regards to keeping up, I think um, it really depends on the specific uh, business of the members. Uh, we have members that are not just keeping up, they're innovating in the sector and they're coming with new proposals and they're doing absolutely amazing. Um, we have others that maybe have not followed the conversation as closely as they should have, um, but they definitely have the opportunity to catch up. Um, we have you know, startups that are very good at the subject, but we have startups that perhaps did not yet see the opportunities or um, their business is not of the, of the sort that would, uh, that would need immediate attention with regards to EU policies, for instance. Um, I, I, I did see something very interesting. I uh, learned, actually, I think I learned about this today, uh, that Moldova adopted the, uh, the NIS2 uh, directive into law directly, right? I think it takes a lot of courage and determination to do that. So I want to congratulate uh, the policymakers on that. It's pretty rare to see, you know, coming together in in a sense, and that shows very clear determination towards EU membership, right? Um, to be frank, Romania still has EU regulation that is directly applicable that we're not yet fully compliant with, um, because we have other regulations and other laws that are, um, you know, come head, head to head with uh, this regulation, and that's uh, in the field of electronic signatures. Um, I mean, we, we've had the uh, ADAS um, regulations since 2014, and Romania still does not have a modern uh, legislation uh, with regards to electronic signatures that meets all the requirements of ADAS. Um, we gladly uh, have had an excellent discussion and a series of consultations with the ITC community uh, and with the ITNC um, uh, parliamentary committee that have been actually very good and I think that we can solve, together we can solve this problem. So I think if policymakers are determined like we've seen in Moldova and like we've seen with the ITNC committee in the Chamber of Deputies in, in Romania, I think that uh, the future is, is great and, and we, can, we can at least um, keep up with it. Uh, I think in order to truly take the lead on this, uh, it will take a, a few years and it will take more coordination and more leadership uh, than, than we have at this moment. And uh, with all that has mentioned, like whether it's uh, regulations or developing AI solutions or being open to its skills are absolutely key, uh, both in policy, in public services and in technological fields within the AI uh, area. And it was mentioned by our colleague from Riga Business School that uh, so more than 50% of the workforce needs to be trained in a play, a play Applied, applied AI, that's really hard to say. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, we had a discussion, uh, I mean, the rector of the Technical University here in Moldova also mentioned this 
uh, skills need and also the role that the university plays, the third role of the university to be a society actor engaged in, in this. So Saber, you are a researcher. How do you see uh, skills uh, as a part of uh, this whole development, whether it's regulatory or if you're an innovator or if you are applying AI to where, where, how do we deal with the skills? Um, actually, um, what AI is doing is, is, I would say, like you know, it is unleashing this what Gutenberg did back in the medieval period. I mean, it's just something that you know will be enormous. We'll see in 50 and 100 years later. So um, I wouldn't say that you know we are. I mean, if you if you look at how you know human uh, history actually gone, uh, we are not really lagging behind. I'm really positive about it. Uh, we are trying to do as much uh, to cope with the new technology, and this is what we should be doing. This is at this point, like you know, it is con creating a lot of confusion, which is normal for any technology. At the beginning, it cr creates a lot of confusion. AI is older than computer science, by the way. I mean, um, but I mean, we never had a good time until now. Like there were like three different times when, when you know, shutdown against AI happened. Um, but that was in the academic per uh, area. Now it's the first time when we are talking in the in 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 in, in normal area actually. So I would say that you know uh, when we think about like you know how we want to cope up with the skills, I would definitely say that we need to really have two type of things. Number one is we need to have more digitally enlightened people, meaning that you don't really need to know how to code, but as you know, other panelists actually said uh, in 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 sessions before, but we need to know how to use them properly. Now, when you have these large language models, we need to know how to use the prompting. We need to know how to ask them better questions. So, you know, looking at you know how uh, I mean, Google has been there for 20, 30 years now. We have been using Google and Yahoo and other you know um, search engines for 30, 20, 30 years, but we still don't know how to search properly. Many people don't know it. Um, that's one skill that you need to learn. Now, these are the ways you, you, you get better. Universities should play a better role to actually enhance the skills in every which way. Now, in arts, in, in, in social science, in, in, in natural sciences, in engineering, wherever it is. Now, this is one thing. The other thing is like, you know, what do we do about our core computer science? Now, core computer science, computer science and computer science uh, and engineers, they work for the people. Problem is that, you know, um, we forgot that we work for the people. Sometimes when you, I mean, when you go through like coding and, you know, building tools, you basically think about yourself. Software engineering is not, I mean, about your own pleasure. It's about society's pleasure. So we need to be human-centric. So more humanistic, um, you know, philosophical, I mean, social scientific courses should be adopted in computer science. That's important. And similarly, these engineering courses should be AI for all, should be something we should be teaching everywhere. I guess in 10 years, this might change. I mean, but uh, that's my two coins. I saw that um, the Swedish Agency for Digital Development, the government agency, they uh, did a calculation that if we applied the AI solutions that are already available now, we would save 14 billion euro per year in public services. This is a huge amount of money. And this connects to, Denisa, what you said earlier about applying the solutions that are already there. Uh, and what, how do you see skills uh, as a part of that? And I'm adding on uh, in the same uh, question. Uh, we're in Moldova, and Moldova is at a really interesting point of development with this EU path, with a lot of technology happening. Uh, what advice would you give to Moldova from your perspective? Uh, I'm going to be uh, sorry, but I will speak less about skills because it's not really my area, and I'd rather not, you know, uh, yeah, find some, yeah, bullshit answer. But uh, I can speak about uh, Moldova and 
I'd say that someone yesterday said, mentioned something about having to wait 25, I think it was you, 25 minutes to, for your daughters, yeah. And I was like, wow, 25, I had to like take a day off to do that in Romania. So I think uh, when it comes to uh, the political willingness to change, to ambition and like drive, I think Moldova is on the right track compared to other countries that I'm, uh, well, uh, yeah, used to. Uh, so um, I think you have what is there, it's just a matter of, uh, well, first of all, I think many governments are working in silos and basically they're not communicating with each other, digital and is a horizontal um, policy area which should be, you know, integrated in each ministry and it should be like developed, you know, uh, some kind of task force at least in each ministry to like think about what kind of solutions you can, um, you can adopt. Um, so this is one recommendation, don't work in silos communicate, um, yeah, then, um, yeah, focus on, uh, I think this recommendation was also in another panel, focus on like, I don't know, top three or top five things uh, you, can, uh, you can do best instead of having like a long list of um, objectives that are not achievable because there's no human resource or financial resource or uh, something else. Um, yeah, when it comes to to uh, the, poli the, um, the policy interventions, I think, uh, considering the geopolitical uh, role of Moldova, cybersecurity is very important. And I guess there, like, we need more investments and more um, um, res uh, resilience building. And, um, yeah, I think that's kind of it. Thank yeah. you so much. You. Uh, Zaber, if you would give some advice to Moldova now when uh, we're here, what would be your uh, couple of advice? Well, uh, two things I would say. Number one is uh, there are two ways to uh, you know, go about it. Uh, one is to actually piggyback on technologies that are being developed in other countries. Um, the other one is to actually develop your own. Now, I would say that we have to do both. Uh, Moldova as a growing country, you cannot stop doing things. So, uh, parallelly, you need to actually consume new technologies open up the arena so that people, people of different you know, aspects would actually use different type of technologies. That's one thing. But at the same time, you grow your own skill in your universities. Research and development is the own, only key. Now, if you look at what, how United States is different from the whole world and, and why it dictates a lot of things in the world, it's because it, it actually learned to fail. Most of the research work, most of the research fund that goes in U.S. universities, which I also got some funds as well, and I failed a lot of times and succeeded in a few times. But nobody told me, like, you know, you are a failure. That's one thing. That's one aspect of giving money for research. Research is always not about success. So I would say that, you know, we should piggyback on good technology, ethical, resilient technology in AI so that people can use them. That's one thing. We should regulate that and make them possible. Other way around is to make the universities powerful. Let the students fail and do a lot more research on them and uh, bring the capability and skills. That's I think. Thank you. And Robert, we'll give you the, the last uh, chance to, to give some advice to uh, Moldova from your perspective. Uh, I'll, I'll try to actually frame it in a different uh, perspective, so it's not, um, it's an observation more than an advice. Um, I was deeply impressed by the presentations we've seen from the Electronic Governing Agency yesterday. And I was impressed, of course, by the solutions they presented, but I was mostly impressed by the culture, the organizational culture I've discovered within this agency. If you can mimic, or not mimic, but um, learn from that culture or maintain that culture, which is a culture that promotes innovation, that promotes um, solutions, lateral thinking, um, more of the horizontal leadership structure, not a vertical leadership structure, then good things will happen. There's a reason, you know, people look at IT companies and they say, oh, you have those beautiful offices, you have like, uh, you know, you have hammocks in your offices. Why do you have hammocks in offices? Well, there's a good reason for that. Because innovation happens in an environment like that. If you're too afraid to tell your boss about an idea you had, that's a loss for the company. 
So the same thing has to be applied in, in organizational um, and leadership structures within the state uh, institutions. The more state institutions you have that are organized like that, the more successful you will be. And, and we, uh, this is not my advice to Moldovans, this is something I would like to congratulate them that because they have an agency like that. And I would love to see that in Romania as well. We need to reduce that power distance between uh, the big boss and the developer. And that's, that's how the most successful IT companies work. The developer has a lot of leverage and leeway and, and comes up with the... Sorry? Let's unite the two countries. Let's unite the two countries. <laughs> see, see, an administrative problem, this border, why does it exist, you know? It, it's, an, it's an administrative problem that should not exist probably. So, and, and we are also discussing, you know, the Schengen problems of Romania, right? It would be much easier to cross into Hungary, to cross, you know, without these borders. So, so if we reduce that power distance, we don't have a problem anymore with regards to bureaucracy and all these issues. So I've heard uh, about regulation, I've heard about skills, I've heard about uh, people-centered uh, conversations, uh, both conversations like people-centered focus in AI development, uh, but also conversations between private sector, between public entities, civil society, and others, and try, try the solutions that are out there. With that, I say thanks very much for listening to this panel with our three amazing guests, so thank you. Katarina Moynur, Denis, and Robert, thank you so much for this interesting discussion. And we are about to start the preparation for the next panel. So welcome back to Moldova Digital Summit. Okay, we are continuing with another interesting panel. Uh, the next is Tech for Business, Digital Futures Designed for Internal Processes. And this panel is chaired by Alexandru Gozun, Director of PricewaterhouseCooper Moldova and President of American Chamber of Commerce of the Republic of Moldova. Alex, hello. And I'm Hi. letting you introducing uh, the speakers. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our AmCham powered panel. Ca să diversificăm un pic discuțiile de până acum din două zile, vom avea acest panel în română și ne vom referi mai mult la experiența din Republica Moldova. Um, deși denumirea panelului ar putea sugera un pic un caracter poate mai tehnic al, al subiectului pe care vrem să-l punem în discuție, Totuși, așa cumva mai specifice afacerilor ca soluții tehnice, 
Totuși, noi vom încerca să dăm un pic un alt unghi acestei discuții, cu focus pe transformare digitală a unei companii, mai degrabă din perspectiva experienților manageriale, dacă vreți, și cu aspecte emoționale ale acestui parcurs, dintr-o dimensiune în care pornim de la luarea deciziei sau înțelegerea oportunității de digitalizare spre setarea acelei limite unde digitalizarea afacerii deja poate să treacă, adică echilibru dintre costul și beneficiul digitalizării, s-ar putea să nu fie neapărat în, într-un într punct în care chiar este favorabilă dezvoltării companiei și să ne uităm și la anumite lecții învățate pe parcursul implementării diferitor proiecte de digitalizare care ar putea fi și bune și rele. În ultimele 40 plus ore au fost discutate foarte multe aspecte care sunt relevante discuții noastre de astăzi, atât de la tehnologiile legacy, tehnologiile emergente, cum ele pot impacta interacțiunea în interiorul companiei, interacțiunea companiei cu piața. Vrem să... Încercăm să prindem cât mai mult din asta în acest panel și pentru a avea o abordare cât mai reprezentativă am încercat să compilăm din, din cadrul comunității Amceam un panel de speaker care au trecut sau sunt novici sau au trecut deja cu experiență destul de multă prin, prin acest proces de digitalizare a, a businessului lor. Respectiv, îl avem pe Ștefan, care cred că are digitalizarea în ADN. Cel puțin sânge, dar în ADN aproape sigur. Și pe lângă a transforma digitalizarea dintr-un interes strict de optimizare a activității afacerii, într-un hobby mai mult, aș zice eu, care transcede cumva și în viața personală, să ne povestești tu mai multe. O avem pe Natalia, care a învățat din multiple proiecte derulate în cadrul grupului Felicia, că digitalizarea poate avea fețe diferite și bune și rele, ca și Ianus din mitologie. Da? Și l-avem pe Alexandru, care reprezintă Rogop, este CEO a Rogop și a inițiat un proces, un proiect destul de complex, care este în derulare și bănuiesc cu nerăbdare așteaptă să vadă cum se va finaliza implementarea proiectului și care vor fi rezultatele. Și acestea fiind spuse, am să te rog pe tine, Ștefan, să ne povestești un pic, să ne dai cumva tonul uh, din adâncurile acelui, uh, acelei pasiuni pentru digitalizarea proceselor în cadrul companiilor care, pe care le conduci și cum, uh, cum ai ajuns tu la această, această percepție a necesității digitalizării și validare a faptului că este de fapt o decizie corectă. Dacă vorbim despre beneficii, beneficiile sunt mult mai plăcute atunci când știi că ele sunt măsurabile. Noi ne-am propus ca companie să măsurăm absolut fiecare proces în, 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 în workflow-ul ăsta care îl avem zilnic. Dar până, până una alta, aș fi vrut, dacă tot aveți acces la internet, să intrați pe un site care se numește farm.bot. Um, și eu am să, eu am să revin la, la, la site-ul ăsta. Um, deci, nu am identificat niște puncte de tangență cu, cu compania noastră și nu contează cine le are, că, de exemplu, sunt angajați în interiorul companiei sau managementul sau, sau clienței sau partenerii de afaceri sau vendorii care, cu care noi lucrăm. Deci, peste tot sunt niște puncte de, um, de tangență. Noi am încercat să digitalizăm la maxim, uh, uite, punctele astea, ca feeling-ul sau uh, um, 
feelingul tău ca, ca client da? să fie deosebit. Că practic voi v-ați focusat mai mult pe experiența clientului și asta a fost driverul vostru în uh, decizii de digitalizare. Deci noi am definit clientul nu, jo- nu <laughs> scuz. Deci noi, noi am definit clientul nu doar cel care cumpără de la noi serviciu. Mm-hmm. Uh, noi am de, uh, cl- Angajați în interiorul companiei, noi definim tot ca clienți. Noi toți suntem clienți până la urma urmei. Și noi, noi toți vrem să înregistrăm niște beneficii sau uh, niște procese mai, uh, mai ușoare și mai, mai clare. Uh, de exemplu, când uh, când angajăm în procesul de angajare, deci toate documentele la noi se, se semnează digital până ca angajatul să pășească prima oară în, în oficiu. Deci noi pregătim tot procesul ăsta până a, a se întâmpla, înțelegi? Um, dacă să vorbim despre despre șoferi, da. Um, deci șoferii pentru noi e un risc foarte mare și foarte greu de calculat. Noi am încercat undeva um, să măsurăm fiecare segment în, în tot procesul ăsta, și să, poate, să putem din, din, din toată metadata asta să tragem niște concluzii, să găsim anumite pattern care undeva să ne ajute la, la o optimizare mai bună a proceselor sau a procedurilor în companie. Cred că n-am lăsat loc în companie unde digitalizarea nu și-o pus amprenta. Și asta nu e tot. Când mă odihnesc, <laughs> mă apuc de digitalizat viața personală, știi? De exemplu, la noi, în, la mine în grădină, de fapt, în pământ pune un robot, de plante are grijă robotul, el udă, el crește, da? el prășește <laughs> și doar îți trimite pe telefon un, un mesaj că uite, trebuie să culegi roada. Și asta e interesant, știi, pentru că pot să mă ocup cu alte lucruri, dar să mănânc sănătos acasă. Mersi frumos. No, interesant, cum ți-ai setat tu limitele, până unde vrei să ajungi cu digitalizarea proceselor, din perspectiva costurilor pe care le aloci și riscurilor la, la, pe care le consideri în primă instanță în momentul în care ia o decizie de a mai schimba ceva. Da? Adică, bine, n-am... n-am menționat că vorbim de un business de tracking, de însua, respectiv e și un cadru de reglementare diferit, instrumentele sunt diferite, disponibilitatea inclusiv a semnăturilor electronice, ziceai că se semnează totul electronic, este diferit, probabil și arhivarea documentelor, adică sunt un pic, e un pic alt context decât în Moldova. Dar tu, pentru tine, când iai decizii, care sunt limitele pe care ți le-ai setat? Unde vrei să ajungi din perspectiva eficientizării performanței versus scopului de a avea lucrurile digitalizate? Știi, să le faci state of the art. Cred că orice digitalizare cu succes trebuie să aibă, în primul rând, o strategie la bază. După asta, un leadership interesant și o echipă care să înțeleagă ce vrei tu să faci. Fără măcar una din aceste componente, digitalizarea pur și simplu nu are sens. Da. Mersi frumos. Natalia zâmbea în timp ce tu vorbeai despre robotul care taie iarba. Și Natalia uh, anterior mi-a zis, și știu de ce zâmbește, deoarece iarba aia mai trebuie mirosită în proces de tăiere. Da, eu ziceam. Eu ziceam că uneori trebuie de tuns iarba uh, nu cu robotul, dar sing- singur că este o plăcere mirosul de iarbă tăiată, este o plăcere deosebită. Și îngrijutul florilor tot, și a roșiilor tot. <laughs> dar asta este probabil de plăcere atunci când o faci, nu am încercat să o fac zilnic, dar poate odată în, în, într-o anumită peri- perioadă. Da, dar Natalia, dacă tot am trecut la experiența și percepția ta a digitalizării, știu că ai câteva slide-uri care mie mi-au părut foarte interesante din perspectiva lecțiilor învățate. Învățate aici, local, după un uh, număr de tentative a digitaliza anumite procese interne și un anumit număr de lecții învățate mai puțin, mai puțin uh, pozitive, să zicem așa, dacă ne poți povesti. Da, mersi. Eu mă numesc Natalia Sturza, conduc grupul de companii Felicia. Am să 
probabil ca să înțelegeți de unde am ajuns noi la așa o experiență, într-adevăr, Businessul farmaceutic cumva a fost unul din puținele businessuri care a fost obligat să se digitalizeze. Încă 20 de ani în urmă, noi am avut un, un soft care cumva am fost impuși să-l să implementăm și atunci, în jurul acestui proces, a pornit ex experiența noastră și eu am... Am să încerc să împărtășesc acești 20 de ani de experiență care, luând în calcul unde suntem acum, cu unul din cele mai mari depozite farmaceutice, cu distribuție națională, cu rețele de farmacii, de optici, noi putem probabil să ne asumăm dreptul de a împărtăși această experiență și, într-adevăr, unele chestii, eu nu degeaba am făcut acest slide, Digitalizarea este foarte bună, ea îți poate fi un foarte mare aleat, dar în același timp ea este și un pericol. Este un pericol pen, pentru business și dacă nu este făcută corect, așa cum am scris mărunt, ea într-adevăr îți poate dăuna. Eu am luat patru exemple, ele sunt mult mai, mai multe. Eu am luat patru exemple de, de greșeli, și soluții prin care am, tre am trecut noi și aș vrea să le prezint ast astăzi. Probabil una din cele mai frecvente gânduri sau, sau cele mai frecvente ide idei care apar în cadrul conducătorilor este de ce trebuie de digitalizat acum. Eu nu am echipă pregătită, eu nu am timp, eu nu am bani, eu nu am acum Posibilit. Mâine, garantat, mă, mă ocup. Astăzi fac, facem, facem această pauză. E, pentru noi a fost e, foarte elocvent exemplul COVID-ului și probabil după COVID multe alte chestii cu părere de rău s-au întâmplat care ne-au demonstrat cât de important este de luat e, sau, decizia la momentul pot, potrivit. Noi, pe partea de online, Necătând la faptul că businessul online pe partea farma și non-farma este, este mai puțin dezvoltat în Republica Moldova, noi ne-am asumat să o facem. Și atunci, înainte de COVID, acei care aveau acest modul pregătit, lansat, au dat lovitura. A fost ceva neașteptat. Foarte multă lume atunci a început să dezvolte și nu doar din businessul farma, dar este un exemplu viu. Când noi am reușit timp de o săptămână să resetăm tot modulul online și să fim pregătiți să oferim acele servicii care nu le puteau, care erau oportune atunci în 2020. A doua. A doua iluzie, ca să o numesc așa, este că noi digitalizăm procesele care le avem. Deci avem procesul de achiziție care se făcea într-un Excel. Acum o să automatizăm acest proces de achiziție, o să automatizăm și o să digitalizăm calculele și deja calculatorul ne va da soluția sau ne va pregăti această comandă sau procesul de vânzare. Deci operatorii în cazul distribuției naționale telefonau anterior farmaciștii din teritoriu și premiau la, la telefon comanda. Acum prin faptul că noi doar am automatizat și avem un price online și farmaciile pot să facă deja comenzile online, noi cumva ne-am gata, ne-am digitalizat. Păi nu a fost chiar așa deoarece până la urmă noi ne-am ciocnit cu ideea că oricum operatorii telefonau și anunțau farmaciștii despre anumite uh, promoții sau despre an, uh, um, balanța contului sau uh, noi eram telefonați mereu de către clienți și farmacii cu anumite uh, rugăminți privitor la timpul de livrare, modul de livrare și așa mai, mai departe. Deci până la urmă Aparent, digitalizarea nu ne-a dat nicio plus valoare. Și atunci noi am pornit-o din altă parte, 
Noi am analizat exact așa cum ați spus, dar ce vrem noi? Ce vor clienții? Ce vor angajații? Ce vrea businessul? Ce cerem noi de la ei? Și am pornit de la ideea că nu, deci, ne setăm acele ob obiective, vedem ce pași trebuie făcuți și ce, cum exact trebuie să digitalizăm pe etape ca să atingem acele ob obiective și doar atunci pornim acest proces. Da, avem riscul ca să, să nu la toți angajații să placă, să placă aceste schimbări. Dar în cazul în care noi um, urmărim aceste obiective, digitalizarea într-adevăr își atinge scopul. Un alt, o altă iluzie care o aveam noi este faptul că va veni cineva și ne va salva, în, în sensul că noi vom merge la o companie IT care are un soft gata pregătit, noi vom, mai, vom plăti pentru el, el, ei îl vor implementa și noi vom fi salvați. Um, nu a fost așa să fie, uh, avem experiență foarte pozitivă cu companii destul de vestite care, și destul de renumite, hai să le spun așa, care ne-au învățat că nu există salvatori de așa gen în domeniul digitalizării. Nu putem să digitalizăm procesele fără implicarea noastră, fără implicarea angajaților, fără implicarea conducătorilor. Noi, când am ajuns la etapa de digitalizare a proceselor în cadrul depozitului, recepția, colectarea, distribuția, compania care ne-a automatizat acest proces a venit... Deci noi mai întâi am mers la foarte multe depozite, am văzut ce oportunități au, am găsit aparent compania potrivită, am mers la clienții acestei companii, ei au venit la noi și au stat trei luni. Acum, în fiecare an, vin în audit la noi și în continuare perfecționăm și perfecționăm aceste procese. Deci, um, sfatul meu este să nu contați pe faptul că cineva știe procesele voastre mai bine ca voi și cineva știe ce vreți voi mai bine ca, ca voi. Nu este așa și chiar este foarte interesant când ne implicăm toți împreună. Aici fac, aș fac, fac puțin referință la ceea ce a spus mai devreme și Ștefan despre o digitalizare totală. Noi, eu am am urmărit o, niște momente într-o companie cu care am, am avut parteneriat anterior și am rămas surprinsă la ideea Păi vindeți-ne, noi vrem să cumpărăm de la voi. Păi nu vă vindem, că ne stricăm indicatorii și avem un indicator de care depinde salariul nostru. Sau nu facem un contract că avem că nu o să reușim să-l închidem până la sfârșitul lunii, iar KPI-ul nostru este 100% de tranzacții închise. Deci este foarte e, fină această linie când tehnologia înlocuiește oamenii în detrimentul businessului. Deci eu am văzut mai multe situații când oamenii erau puși în slujba e, instrumentelor digitale, nu invers. Ori eu sunt ferm convinsă că digitalizarea este un, un instrument și ea trebuie pusă în, în, în serviciul oamenilor. Oricum deciziile trebuie să aparțină oamenilor și această limită este foarte um, delicată. Am totalizat aici acele patru situații despre care am vorbit anterior. Um, se merită de digitalizat, dar trebuie să avem ferma încredere că aceasta trebuie făcută cu implicarea noastră, cu implicarea angajaților. Trebuie să avem o viziune foarte clară ce ne dorim noi de la fiecare etapă, ce ne dorim de la modulul HR, ce ne dorim de la modulul BI, ce ne dorim de la modulul de vânzare, de la CRM. 
Și atunci când toate aceste lucruri sunt puse la punct, noi avem, cum spun eu, o grădină zoologică de, de softuri. Deoarece noi nu am mers pe o singură sol soluție. Noi mereu am căutat soluția cea mai bună. Le-am integrat în, între ele. Unele sunt în cloud, altele sunt dezvoltările noastre personale, unele sunt achiziționate. Deci am mers mereu pe soluția cea mai oportună la moment at atunci pentru business. Și ace această, această experiență ne-a adus și un succes cu, cu, cu care astăzi ne, ne mândrim. Mulțumesc! Mulțumesc frumos, Natalia! Știi, ai spus, dar fugitiv, că au fost și perioade în care a fost și o anumită rezistență sau poate o înțelegere diferită de către, de către echipă a necesității digitalizării și a schimbării în sine. Cum ați depășit? Este foarte important pentru echipe să înțeleagă pentru ce ei asta fac. Iată, atunci când acei care îți sunt alături, umăr de umăr, înțeleg, este probabil ca într-o familie, toți trebuie să se uite într-o direcție și să vadă același lucru. Iată, în situația în care oamenii se uită într-o direcție, dar văd lucrurile diferit, atunci procesele nu merg. Trebuie să ai curajul, puterea, răbdarea, să explici la oameni de ce astăzi trebuie de făcut anume așa și unde noi vrem să ajungem. Și atunci este ușor de, de împins această corabie, indiferent cât, câtă lume nu este în, în ea, este ușor de împins în aceeași direcție. Și atunci, Ștefan, am să te rog pe tine să comentezi un pic dacă ai și alte uh, sugestii în contextul aceleași întrebări inclusiv pe cât de mult există, a existat în experiența ta frica că tehnologia, de fapt, îi va înlocui pe oamenii cu care ai lucrat și care lucrezi și asta, va, asta ar genera din nou acea rezistență la schimbare. Inițial mă gândeam că așa va fi. Mă gândeam că am să locuiesc cu oamenii cu, cu tehnologii și o să fiu singurul care o să mănânjesc toată compania Uh, eficient, așa cum vreau eu, <laughs> dar din păcate, din fericire, nu din păcate, mă scuzați, e din fericire, uh, nu am fost nevoit uh, să concidez absolut pe nimeni. Uh, tehnologia ne-a ajutat nu, nu mai mult cât să optimizăm uh, costurile de HR, cât să mărim standardele în uh, serviciilor noastre. Și cred că niciodată n-am să, în detrimentul, în detrimentul calității serviciilor, niciodată nu o să dau pe cineva afară. Dar eu am o întrebare pentru Natalia. Te rog. Dacă tot am, dacă tot am înregistrat niște vânzări, la sigur aveți o vânzare medie pe fiecare articol în fiecare magazin. La sigur ați setat un stoc minim și un stoc maxim um, care puteți să-l aveți în magazin sau puteți să-l stocați în magazin sau e optimal de-l stocat în, în magazin. Dacă aveți doar măsurările astea, spuneți-mi cu, cu cât costurile de stocare a articolilor s-au îmbunătățit. Sau, deci noi am, imediat ce am implementat sistemul de stock man, management, nu doar cu stock minim și cu stock maxim, dar și cu revederea lui la fiecare trei zile, în dependență de fluctuația, deoarece la noi în farmaceutică sezonalitatea este destul de sensibilă, noi am redus stocurile din farmacii cu 20%. Super! A apărut o cifră în discuție și asta mă ajută. În șase luni, recunosc, în șase luni, dar, au, dar, dar au fost, a fost o, o cifră foarte impresionantă. E impresionant, într-adevăr, în șase luni, 20% e foarte impresionant, dar asta mă ajută să-l întreb pe Alexandru. Atunci când au inițiat proiectul de transformare digitală a unei funcții, cum, în baza căror indicatori, nu neapărat în detaliu, dar care a fost raționamentul beneficiului așteptat, cum l-ați calculat și cum ați luat decizia de a investi în asta, 
considerând beneficiile potențial, potențial realizabile în acest context. Bună tuturor! Mă numesc Alexandru, sunt manager de proiect în cazul dat despre ceea ce a spus Alexandru compania Rogob și voi vorbi despre intralogistică. Deci este vorba despre un proces logistic în interiorul unui warehouse, unui depozit cu producție finită. Cred că toată lumea prezentă cunoaște ce produse comercializează compania pe care o reprezint, compania Rogob. Și având în vedere că fiecare companie din Republica Moldova tinde să se dezvolte și aplică diferite tehnici de management, diferite tehnici ce ține de promovarea brandului producției sale. Iată că și noi în 2017, la, spunem așa, la planificarea bugetului pentru anul viitor, am hotărât să extindem da, acest BP pentru 5 ani de zile. Deci noi în 2017 ne-am văzut cum vom fi în 2022. Iată că, având în vedere cunoscutele evenimente COVID plus războiul din Ucraina, am fost nevoiți să mai abandonăm proiectul. Dar, cum a spus și Natalia, nu, nu trebuie să spui că o vom face mâine, fiindcă azi la fel va fi mâine. Oricum am hotărât să mergem înainte și am pornit prin identificarea furnizorului de soluție, da? să spunem așa că soluția noastră se divizează în două părți. Este vorba de fier, să nu se râdă cei din IT, deci chiar este vorba de fier inox, ce ține de legătura da? dintre producția propriu-zisă și depozit. Și este vorba despre un depozit gravitațional, un robot care dirijează cu toate produsele în acest depozit la capitolul intrări și un soft, la fel am ales un soft german, unii companii compatibile cu cei care prestează fierul și robotul. Am încheiat toate, 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 toate aceste analize, activități într-un contract trilateral și ca să nu fie surpriză pentru toată lumea, deci construcția acestui sistem logistic durează mai mult decât construcția spațiului propriu zis, unde se va desfășura aceste activități. Acum am sincronizat foarte bine toți pașii, deci noi finalizăm în două săptămâni construcția depozitului propriu zis, cu frig, cu comunicații, cu de toate, și în două săptămâni sunt gata camioanele la încărcat cu fier, după care mai merge un camion și ia toată partea electronică. Iată că soluția dată ne va permite să optimizăm toate procesele care se produc în depozit. Este vorba despre colectarea comenzilor pentru a fi livrate spre clienții noștri finali, nu contează, ori B2B, ori spre magazinele proprii. Dacă, Alexandru, scuze, dacă dorești și cifre, pot să dau cifre concrete, dar abia suntem în derulare și efectul doar pot să-l spun din ceea ce vedem noi că se va întâmpla și cum vom optimiza. Poți să-mi spui dacă este comparabil cu cifra pe care a enunțat-o Natalia, pe care a atins 120% eficientizare? Haideți să spun altfel. Deci astăzi un picker, într-un schimb de lucru, poate opera cu 3 tone de produs. Vorbesc 3 tone de produs, asta nu sunt saci și ori lăzi pline, 3 tone de produs, asta ar fi undeva asigurarea la 60 de clienți cu produsele comandate. Noi vom ajunge la cifra de 4 3 tone într-un schimb de 8 ore. La fel, vorbesc despre același număr de ore. Super. Paftă. Poate ne vedem cu, această, cu o altă ocazie și povestim despre rezultate când, când se finalizează proiectul. Dar 
Am o întrebare, cumva, pornind de la ceea ce a zis Alexandru către Ștefan și Natalia. Au fost situații în care ați mers până la jumătate sau un pic peste jumătate din proces de optimizare a, sau digitalizare a ceea ce v-ați propus și ați înțeles că nu e direcția corectă? Ok. Cine încerc? Da, noi am avut, eu, noi am avut asemenea situații, eram în perioada de implementare DBI și l-am contractat, am început lucru, am, am început um, sin sincronizarea datelor. La un moment dat am înțeles că nu cei ce se primește, sau mai bine zis, cei ce ni s-a prezentat nouă inițial, că va fi un rezultat final, nu, nu era în măsura așteptărilor noastre. Și atunci ne-am asumat um, întreruperea acestui contract și reînceperea proiectului. Dar probabil acum mi-am amintit o, o situație și mai e, periculoasă care aș vrea să o... Am avut un contract e, pentru licențe de... pentru punct, punctele de, de vânzare. E, era ceva achiziționat, deci nu era nimic pe, pe interior. Și la un moment dat ne-am trezit cu modificarea condițiilor și cu o dependență de care noi nu puteam să... Deci noi nu puteam să ne refuzăm, să, deci noi eram impuși să acceptăm acele condiții. Deci aceasta a fost, pe moment a fost foarte dureros, dar ne-a făcut să ne dezvoltăm propriul sistem, să-l dezvoltăm pe interior, să-l facem exact după cerințele noastre, Ulterior, în baza lui, am dezvoltat și un sistem de loializare și reușim acum să avem 400 de mii de, de clienți cu carduri care le, le avem foarte, foarte clar care sunt preferințele lor, ce cumpără acești oameni și putem să le oferim oferte personalizate pentru fiecare client. Deci încercăm cumva din tot răul să scoatem și partea bună. Este foarte important după mine, atunci când simțim că nu merge, să avem curajul să tăiem, chiar cu anumite costuri pe moment, dar să începem de la, de la zero. Deoarece eu cred că te, așa, te prinde cavalul și te, te duce la, la fund și atunci ajungem la primul slide sau a doilea care era la, la mine. Cu curaj am tăiat și am mers în, înainte. Mersi frumos. Ștefan? Um, sigur că în procesul ăsta de digitalizare am vrut uh, și părerea la ceva experți. Uh, I-am făcut mare greșeală că am uh, contractat uh, super experți foarte scumpi. Uh, am făcut o greșeală foarte mare pentru că am semnat un contract pe 2 ani de zile cu experții ăștia și undeva pe perioada contractului, înțelegei că nu merge ceea ce vrea el, de el îți spunea că, uite, încă un pic, încă o săptămână și acuși, acuși pornește, știi? Și tu deja vezi că cheltui 200 de mii dolari pentru nimic, dar uite, într-o săptămână am ușa să împuște, știi? Nu e așa, când, când simți că nu merge ceva, oprești imediat, indiferent ce costuri ai avut. Eu am putut să opresc totul la 20 de mii dolari pierderi, cred că acum am pierderi peste un milion. 300, 300 poveste, dar uh, lasă-mă să te întreb și o chestie care ține mai de viitor un pic din punct de vedere a tehnologiilor. Uh, am tot auzit și ieri și astăzi foarte mult AI în această sală. Foarte mult. Din punct de vedere practic, pentru businessul pe care îl conduci, unde vezi tu aplicabilitatea, uh, hai să zicem, imediată, nu într-o perspectivă de durată medie sau lungă, dar imediat, unde vezi tu eventual aplicabilitatea machine learning AI? Uh, pe noi, inteligența artificială, de fapt, uh, ne ajută foarte mult unde nu avem inteligență umană. Așa. Deci, o inteligență artificială uh, identifică uh, consistent, permanent, uh, o rutină zilnică, niște alerte. Deci, uite, inteligența artificială e, e 
e foarte bună la, la generat alerte. Pentru că identifică cu o precizie mult mai mare problema. E clar că toate aceste alerte trebuie undeva validate, pentru că în contabilitate noi știm așa un principiu first in, first out, dar să mă scuzați, în, data, în databases, adică în, în bazele de date, este așa o expresie shit in, shit out, știi? Așa că trebuie să avem, <laughs> of, trebuie să fim foarte atenți ce introducem acolo și cum după asta interpretăm toate datele care sunt. Mersi frumos. Uh, cum, uh, considerând că tu operezi în SUA, iar... Uh, Natalia și Alexandru reprezintă companii care operează în Republica Moldova. Când vorbeam cu tine, Ștefan, zilele trecute despre cum ai tu setate procesele, am văzut elemente care n-ar fi fost posibile în Moldova, în virtutea anumitor, hai să spun așa, limitări din punct de vedere al contextului în care ne aflăm, inclusiv aceleași semnături electronice, disponibilitatea lor. Vorbeam despre arhivarea pe care voi o țineți integral digitală, la noi nu este posibil acum, trebuie să ai și, o, și opțiunea pe hârtie și așa mai departe. Și atunci vreau să întreb și pe Natalia și pe Alexandru. Ce obstacole, dacă ați văzut, în digitalizarea proceselor pe care ați fi dorit să o faceți în companii, le-ați simțit ca obstacole venind din, din partea mediului extern, da? cadrul de reglementare sau anumitor cerințe care v-au oprit în, în implementarea anumitor proiecte de digitalizare. Uh, cer scuze. Am avut parte și eu de implementarea unor proiecte. Vorbesc, oricum o să repet câte ceva, dar vorbesc de ceea ce a spus și Natalia. Vorbesc de un satelit al softului nostru care ne ajută să plăsăm comenzile de la, imediat de la clientul unde este vizitat de către agentul comercial. Și... Putem urmări nu atât locația clientului, cât și istoricul, ce comandă, frecvența cu care se plasează comenzile. Evident, eu îmi construiesc logistica cu livrările, în dependență de aceasta. Iată că la achiziția, ori decizie de achiziție a softului dat, am întâmpinat, vorbim doar de mediul extern, o problemă că nu, nu găseam o companie locală, care să-mi ofere o astfel de soluții la, să spunem, la un preț calitate acceptabil de către noi. Am găsit o astfel de soluție în România, însă acolo cunoașteți că, bun, pe lângă domeniul legislativ sunt mai multe alte reguli, mai multe alte sisteme de colectare comenzi, România este o țară mare, care lucrează prin hub logistice și noi putem livra direct de la fabrică, etc. Însă, cu efortul comun al partenerilor noștri români, colegilor noștri de la IT și al tuturor celor implicați în proiect, am depășit toate greutățile. Deci, cel mai important este să fii focusat spre rezultat. Okay. Asta e. Mersi frumos. Natalia? Noi suntem un domeniu hiperreglementat și atunci conexiunea noastră cu exteriorul este, este foarte, foarte reglementată. Mă refer aici la vânzările online, care am vrea poate să le dezvoltăm mai intens, dar acum avem anumite restricții. Mă refer la rețetele electronice și sper foarte mult ca să reușească ceea ce au planificat colegii de la Ministerul Sănătății și atunci vom putea mult mai bine să integrăm acest flux de informație între farmacie, medic, pacient, ca să ușurăm, deoarece noi ne-am dorit foarte mult să oferim această oportunitate pacienților. 
ei când vin în farmacie deja să fie pregătit produsul, el deja să fie pe, pe stoc, să nu umble pacientul să, dintr-o farmacie în, în alta. Exact așa autorizațiile de import care noi fiecare produs trebuie autorizat special. Deci noi suntem foarte, foarte conectați cu multe organisme începând cu vama și terminând cu, cu e, centrul pentru achiziții în, în sănătate sau e, colegii care se, se ocupă de pe partea de asigurări. De, ace de aceea ne, ne dorim foarte mult ca această conexiune să fie cât mai rapid setată și, și suntem deschiși să o facem și noi din, din, din partea noastră. Super, mulțumesc frumos. Timpul nostru a expirat. Concluzia mea din acest panel este că digitalizarea proceselor de business este un must-have atât timp cât este făcut corect, pornind de la o strategie și de la o analiză a proceselor corecte și adaptare inclusiv la mediul extern, rezultatele de eficientizare pot fi într-adevăr spectaculoase, inclusiv ca în cazul celor care au vorbit astăzi. Mulțumesc frumos pentru atenție și cred că cu aceasta închide panelul. Mersi! Mulțumim mult tuturor celor care ne urmăresc încă online. Cu acest panel închidem ziua numărul 2. Urma să mai avem încă, un, încă o sesiune pe Creative, dar poate revenim cu ea pe parcurs în regim online. Cred eu că acest ultim panel a fost probabil un exemplu foarte clar despre oportunitățile digitalizării, dar în același timp cât de mult trebuie de atras atenția experiența altor colegi în ceea ce, 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 ce vizează incluziunea, ce fel de servicii alegem, sub ce formă și tot așa mai departe. Mulțumim încă o dată tuturor partenerilor care susțin Moldova Digital Summit pe tot parcursul acelor trei zile. Mâine vă așteptăm la Tecul Expo. Pentru mai multe detalii, nu ezitați să ne găsiți pe rețelele de socializare și desigur că în cadrul la Tecul Expo există mai multe workshop-uri, inclusiv conferința pe project management, la care sperăm noi că ați reușit să vă înregistrați și să participați. Toți paneliștii de astăzi și de ieri au fost minunați și abia așteptăm următoarele uh, întrevederi alături de voi. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.